to order. And uh, does everybody have that agenda in front of them? Do we have uh, any declaration of pecuniary interest with regards to the, um, the agenda for the Committee of the Whole this morning? Okay, seeing none. Um, at this time, uh, through you, Madam CAO, we have a delegation uh, from our auditors, or maybe through Kevin. And uh, I'll pass this, uh, so it's Victoria Watson and Tracy Smith from BDO. And this is for the 2019 Gray County audit. And uh, so um, from that, I do, I do have it moved by Councilor Patterson and Councilor O'Leary for that to be uh, recognized. But uh, Madam CEO, do you wish to um, take over on that? Oh, do we have Kevin? I can't, somebody's, I can't hear somebody on there. Kevin, Kim, you're on you... mute. I apologize, everyone. And and Kevin Leppler, I believe you were going to introduce this item. Yeah, this is um, our our annual visit from um, from Vicky and Tracy from BDO. So um, I'm, I think you're all very familiar with them, and uh, they're uh, prepared here to uh, present uh, their audit findings, and they are going to take control of the sc the Zoom screen here and. And present and I'd like to welcome them here and uh, and at the end we offer some other comments uh, once once they're completed and, and councils had their chance to uh, ask some questions so welcome uh, Tracy and, and Vicki. Thanks Kevin um, can can everyone hear me make sure I'm yeah okay I got some, I got some nods um, I was just laughing that um, that my oh now I can start apparently I can start my no I can't start my video um, uh, the the host is not letting me show my picture so I I uh, although I don't have one of those burly beards I, I am sporting the COVID gray uh, look but uh, but uh, um, I, I I apparently am not allowed to put my uh, video on so I'll just uh, I'll just talk I'll just talk um, so again thank uh, thank the committee for oh no <laughs> just making me put my video on. Um, so I'd like Take to thank the committee, uh, Victoria, uh, hello, <laughs> hi everyone, <laughs> uh, Victoria Watson is also um, on the call, um, and she is much younger than me, so um, she is in charge of the technology and, and sharing, uh, sharing the screen. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Kevin and Mary Lou and Joanna um, and their team, they have, um, and thank them for their patience as we learn to navigate our our new virtual world here. Um, we appreciate the support that they provide and the completeness and quality of the working papers. Um, everything is always um, in, in amazing shape um, for us to, to do the audit. So we thank them very much for, for that. Um, so as your auditor, we have the responsibility to communicate with those charged with governance on an annual basis, which, uh, which is you. Um, the report that is on your screen, um, uh, um, includes all the all the required communication under auditing standards. Many of these uh, items are the same as in prior year as the content is prescribed by those accounting standards, um, but we do have to communicate with you every year. Um, so I'm going to provide just a brief summary of this communication and then Vicki will do the high level overview of the draft financials and the graphical report. Um, since we are virtual, I think what we will do is um, after the, uh, the wordy part, we'll stop and, and ask if anyone has questions. And then again, at the end of the numbers, we can um, take any questions at that time. So the, just going through the summary of the communication to you, the status of the audit, the financial statements are draft. Uh, they can't be released in final until the council has approved them. Once we get that approval from um, the committee or council, um, once we get that um, approval, we still need to obtain outstanding confirmations, um, a signed representation letter up to the date of that approval, and also some subsequent event work that we do up to the, the date of the approval. Amount, amounts are material if they would affect the decisions of users relying on the financial statements. The overall materiality um, was 2,750,000. Uh, 
Uh, performance materiality is just over 2 million and what performance materiality is used for, it's used to focus the audit and to identify um, our, the amounts that we're testing through statistical sampling. Um, we then take that performance materiality and um, we use thresholds of 10 to 20 percent, so, so down the $200,000, $300,000 range to look at some um, specific items and do some stamp testing and analytical procedures. In terms of the audit findings, our audit strategy and procedures, they were outlined in our planning report. Um, I will report to you at the annual, um, at this, um, at the conclusion of our audit that there were no changes to our plan procedures and no issues were identified um, in our testing. So, so there were no additional risks that, um, that um, arose out of the audit. Uh, moving on to the internal control matters, we're required to report to you in writing any significant deficiencies in internal control. Um, I am happy to report that during the audit, we did not become aware of any significant um, weaknesses in the design or the implementation of internal control. So there was no issues that, um, that um, we needed to report to the, the uh, committee. Uh, management representation, as I said, we have to obtain a, a management representation um, that they've, they've communicated all of uh, the matters of a financial nature to us during the audit and that uh, a sample is in Appendix B. We are also required to disclose to you if we found any amounts during the audit that have not been adjusted in the financial statements. Um, although all adjustments um, have been made, um, the, again, um, um, Kevin and Mary Lou and Joanna, they do uh, an amazing job on having everything complete and ready before we get there to the audit. So um, we actually did not find anything that, that needed to be adjusted during the audit either. Um, so, so, so there are no um, differences that we are aware of in, in the financial statements that needed to be, um, to be fixed. Uh, moving on to independence, um, we do confirm that we are independent on an annual basis and um, auditing standards do require that we um, communicate on an annual basis um, and have a discussion on the responsibilities to prevent and detect fraud. Uh, we're not aware of any issues uh, and Vicki and I can be contacted directly if um, there are any concerns from um, the committee or from, 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 from management. Um, you can be contacted directly. So that is a summary of the communication. I'm not going to go into detail um, with the remainder of the report. Um, there, are, there are just some more details in there, but I will pause to ask if anyone has any questions before we uh, turn it over to Vicki and the actual numbers. Okay, well, thanks, Tracy. And uh, to uh, county councillors or staff, are there any questions uh, at this time? Well, Teresa, I hear none. I don't have any comments from uh, Kevin, but I hear I don't hear any comments. So go ahead, uh, carry on. Okay, so we'll turn it over to Vic Vicky. All right. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me as well, and my video is also starting. Um, Tracy complains about her gray hairs and perhaps being older than I. I just pull mine all back so you can't see them. They're all under. They're all hidden under the ponytail. Um, my COVID cut is quite long. Um, oh. I probably need a haircut as well <laughs> at this point in time. I might be able to outlast some of your beards. I'm not sure. Um, but thank you very much for having us here today. I get the exciting part, which is all the numbers as well. So I'm going to um, start at page 13 of your package, which is the financial statement portion of um, the information. So starting with the independent auditor's report, I would like to advise that the format of the opinion has not changed since prior year. Our opinion is included um, at the beginning paragraph and we can advise at December 31st, we are providing a clean audit opinion um, and an audit is the highest level of assurance that we can provide. Um, we did review these statements with management prior to today and we have dated the audit report um, for today under the assumption that the drafts will be approved and recommended for signing by the treasurer um, by the committee today. I'm going to advance to the statement of financial position which is page 18 of your package. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the statement of financial position. I'm going to draw your attention 
to the middle of the page, which is the net financial assets. So over the course of the year, there was an increase of nearly $4.2 million in your net financial assets. So if you took a snapshot at December 31st, um, that addition, uh, additional amount would be the amount you have available to use in the future if you paid out your liabilities from your financial assets. Um, this is evidence of a strong financial position. Um, under the net financial assets, you have your non-financial assets. Um, the bulk of that number is represented by your tangible capital assets, so the physical investment in the county of Gray. Um, there was an increase in the tangible capital assets of just under $6 million during the year, which consists of your new purchases of nearly um, $17.5 million, net of disposals and amortization of the year of $11.5 million. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail when I get to our graphical um, analysis. So when you consider the increase in the net financial assets and your increase in non-financial assets, you have an overall increase in your accumulated surplus for the year of just under $10.2 million. And you'll be able to see where this arises on the next page on the Consolidated Statement of Operations um, and accumulated surplus. And we'll look at some of the, um, uh, what makes up that accumulated surplus again in that graphical report. So going to the next page, which is the uh, statement of operations and accumulated surplus, um, starting with the revenues, the largest variance in the revenues was in relation to the government transfers for the year. Projects that were anticipated to be undertaken um, with federal gas tax dollars or other projects um, fundings were not completed during the year. So these dollars remain um, unspent in your deferred revenues to be used in future periods at the end of December. Looking at the expenses for the year, the expenses appear to be over budget by about $11 million, but that $11 million is actually the amount for amortization, which is not a budgeted line item um, as part of the um, budget on an annual basis. And I can show you how this works out again uh, when we get to that graphical analysis. The bottom line, or uh, the third line from the bottom shows the annual surplus for the year at that just under $10.2 million. Um, and we'll go over to that in a little bit. Again, uh, I'll just show you note six um, in a moment. But from this annual surplus, the county pays for the capital asset additions for the year, principal repayments on long term debt, and contributions to reserve. Um, so I'd like to, at this point in time, if we could advance to page 27, um, that's where note six is, which sort of sh brings that um, annual surplus back to. Um, the amounts that are shown um, under your budget um, reconciliation. So there we go. Um, so under the budget note six, um, we start with that annual surplus number, as I showed, of the just under $10.2 million. But from that, there had been transfers to reserves um, recorded. There were anticipated transfers from reserves, um, capital acquisitions, the amortization of assets, the debt principal repayments, and any changes in unfunded amounts. So when we look at this um, note, it does show that um, the amounts do net to zero um, in accordance with how you would have had this information presented originally for your budget purposes. Um, so that's how we start um, with the numbers. Um, there are many, I wasn't gonna go through all the rest of the many details of the financial statements, the notes, and the significant accounting policies but I was gonna pause at this point in time um, to ask if there were any questions about the main financial statements before I go through the graphical report. Okay, thanks uh, Vicki. And um, are there any comments or questions from County Councillors at this point? Well, Vicki, they're, they're following along very carefully and uh, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> So page 48 of the council package is where the graphical report starts. It's the one with the big blue front cover. Um, so I'm going to go through um, the first page here, which has the where, you are, where are you today. And this is where I wanted to break down um, the accumulated surplus for you um, and provide a little bit, few comments on that. So if we are looking at the five-year comparison of accumulated share surplus, it shows evidence of a significant investment in the County of Gray infrastructure through the investment of tangible capital assets. The increase on that first line here, the net book value of tangible capital assets, shows a net increase of over $35 million over the last five years. 
There's also evidence of an increase in reserves of $6 million over that same time period, showing again that you're investing into the future of the County of Gray. When we look at the um, next page, page 51 of your package, um, this is a document that shows where the cash flows for the organization originate from, whether it's from operating um, or if there's cash flows that are outflows um, for capital transactions or financing. Um, so just wanted to provide you um, a little bit of analysis on that one. Um, the next page we go to is the tangible capital assets. Um, so when assets are originally purchased, they are measured at the cost when acquired. So that's the historical cost of those assets. And then those assets are then amortized or expensed over a period of time, um, which is considered to be the useful life of those assets. So just the bar graph at the bottom of this page shows the investment in casual capital assets increasing over the last five years as the replacement policies are being undertaken. Um, another um, neat graph to see is the revenue information for the last four years and the budget, um, which is shown on the page on the screen. So this pie chart shows that the source of funding um, percentages are close for the taxation and government transfers, and they have been quite consistent over the last several years. So we'll have to see where that goes into the future. Um, and where I was sort of alluding to previously, when we look at the um, expenses in comparison to budget um, in the right two most columns here, um, I have to say that when we exclude the amortization um, from those calculations, which is shown on the main audited financial statements, um, the county expenses came in within $32,000 of budgeted costs. And considering the magnitude of all the transactions for the county of Gray, I felt that was a uh, quite a statement to be able to say um, and give credit to council and management for um, achieving their goals um, with such precision um, overall. Um, so when we do go to look at that information graphically, um, we see that the expenses by function at the top of this page, this pie chart, um, the top four expenses that are providing services to the Gray County communities, long-term care, social services, and then tied for third paramedic services and social housing. And to be able to provide those services to the individuals um, and businesses in Gray County, um, we need a lot of staff. Um, and so you'll see that in the second pie chart on that page, uh, payroll costs are the um, highest percentage of costs for the organization. Um, with other transfers providing um, funding to other organizations um, in the, and individuals in the Gray County communities as well. Um, our next page on page 56, um, maybe a report you're familiar with in the past. I'm not going to go through it in detail. It is prepared by management and summarizes the surplus allocations at the end of the year um, and um, any other uh, transfers that were budgeted um, over the course of the year. Um, so that information is for your summary purposes. And then the last two pages we go through um, describe the reserves. So as I, I discussed previously, we have shown an increase in the amounts that have been available to be used in the future through the County of Gray. And graphically, this shows that the county is transferring to reserves for future capital expenditures with a large portion of the reserve balances um, being used for those reserves for capital purposes. And the last page, again, showing um, the obligatory reserve funds and again supporting that there are still amounts retained um, for future expenditure um, with the gas tax dollars um, being on hand at the end of the year due to projects not being um, undertaken. So at this point in time, I was going to conclude um, the financial portion of the presentation. And then again, I would like to um, say, same similar to Tracy, um, thank you to the management team, the staff and council for assistance um, with the audit during this course of the year's audit. Um, their level of preparation facilitated the uh, my audit team. Um, without their documentation, this definitely would have been a lot less efficient and effective um, during these interesting times, I will say. Um, so again, thank you very much to everyone at the County of Gray. Well, thanks, Vicki, and thanks to you and everyone else for the great work that you do. And uh, again, a, a kudos to Kevin uh, on that 117 million 
$32,000 difference. That's pretty, pretty impressive, I would say. So uh, other questions uh, to, uh, to our presenters uh, from County Council or comments. All right. So this uh, report was moved by Councillor Patterson and second by Councillor O'Leary. Um, seeing there's no other points, uh, any opposed to these reports? Hearing none, those, that's carried. Well then I wanna thank to our presenters again, thank you very much for uh, today, all the great work you do in presenting here today. And uh, I don't know, Kevin, do you have any last comments or? Yes, I do, and, and thank you. Um, again, thank you to Tracy and Vicki and their staff. And it, it was a different year with COVID-19. Uh, we were down to about 10 days worth of work trying to get our, our working papers together when we shut down the building. And, and But I have to admit, the finance team, they stayed at it and kept coming in and working on these, trying to get done so that we would have all this information for the auditors to perform their work. and. We took the, a truck, 11 bankers boxes down to the audience to have all our working papers and, and do this. And, and they scheduled that with us and that, so that was very much appreciated. I do have to thank all my staff. Um, they worked hard in this. Um, for the first part of the, uh, of the preparing the audit working papers, I was stuck at home self-isolating as I had been to Florida when the outbreak happened. So. I have to give accolades to Joanna and Mary Lou for leading that group and, and staying with it. So, and uh, I, I do, um, and looking at the financials, um, it's a testament to the staff with the, you know, the limited of, of it, no corrections are needed and, and then the controls are in place and the staff are following them. So I want to thank them for that. And I also want to thank council you, with budgets and stuff. I think you're seeing on our tangible capital assets that we're starting the investments are paying off that we're starting to show our net assets are increasing and that we're the amount that's being amortized we're actually spending more on our betterments of those assets and that is a testament for you committing at budget time extra dollars to capital so so thank you very much for that and again thank you to BO and all of the finance staff okay well thanks kevin on behalf of myself and county council i want to Sincerely thank you and your staff for all the hard work you have done uh, leading up to this uh, to this audit uh, report and all the great work you do out throughout the year and especially with the COVID-19. And so again, thank you for that. All right, so uh, again, I, I guess the, your guests are, are, I guess if they wanna stay on, they can watch <laughs> along or, or whatever, but again, uh, thank you again for doing the great work that you do and, uh, and uh, we'll say goodbye for now. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. I know. Some would say you can have the rest of the day off, but I don't know if somebody could say that or not. But uh, <laughs> All right. So uh, moving on to our agenda then. Um, we have a consent agenda, and uh, that was moved by uh, Councillor Leary and Councillor Mackey. Um, are any of those items wished to be pulled for separate discussion later on of that uh, consent, uh, consent items? And that's moving from A to A to E. So any of those items wish to uh, be pulled? Oh, I hear, I hear no comments. Give everybody a second there to take a look. Again, that was moved by Councillor Leary, seconded by Councillor Mackey. Hearing no discussion, no nothing being pulled forward. Then uh, anybody opposed to those items on consent agenda? That is carried. Okay, thank you very much. So then moving on now to our items for direct for direction and discussion. Uh, we have then, um, this is a report from uh, so, uh, our finance director and corporate services, uh, Kevin Wepler, and this is FRCW 1620, and I have it moved by Councillor Burley and second by Councillor Robinson. And this is with regards to our 10-year capital. So I'm gonna pass this over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Warden. Um, yeah, this, this rep report provides uh, Gray County's third 10-year capital forecast. Um, this is a planning tool that, that forecasts the county's capital expenditure requirements over a, a longer time horizon. Um, 
this is the first time we're presenting this forecast virtually, so it's, there's been no hard copies handed out, or, but the, there is links to the attachments that, uh, for the overall corporate summary and, uh, and as well by each of our, our function breakdowns of corporate services, planning, community development, uh, social services, and trans transportation and public safety. These summaries are, are generated by staff uh, inputting and updating capital project forms. So for each of these line items in here, there's actual a project form that uh, if you click on the link, uh, it's in the report that takes you right to the 10-year capital forecast. You will find a worksheet or a project sheet for each project that details the, the project, the timing of it, how it, and how it's to be funded and, and the need for that project. So I appreciate all the staff. Uh, uh, working away at these and the, the, um, it was a challenge when we first moved to 10 years and now with IT's help when we roll these forward, the staff just need to go in and update them and add the, the 10th year to the program. So um, uh, the consolidated package uh, represents the, the corporate capital funding needs for 2021 in the amount of $17,218,300, which is uh, $880. $1,100 uh, higher than the, the net capital funding that was approved in the in the 2020 budget or, or a 1.47% uh, taxation increase. Um, uh, the, uh, this is a li living, uh, I should say in that 881,000 is a 1% for transportation for that's following our, our asset management that uh, we'll continue to try to increase our spending on that. Um, as per the asset management plan recommendation. Uh, this is a living document. Any changes to capital spending made during the budget process uh, will be incorporated and updated into future forecasts and, uh, and whatever revisions are necessary to the resource availability or inflation or um, need studies, building conditions assessments and, and other funding, uh, funding levels that become available will also be incorporated in into future updates. Um, uh, table one in that report, it breaks down the 10 years um, um, by uh, each of the function departments and, and totals them. And it, this is the, the net levy requirements that showed in this table. And uh, again, for the 2021, it's, uh, it's showing an increase of 881,000. Uh, 2022, 900,000. And like 2023 is 977,000. So um, roughly about, uh, you know, one and a, one and a half to 1.6% increase. And that's incorporating that 1% for transportation. So I mentioned this, this 10 year capital forecast, there is a link to it and it is, it is, can be found on our, on our corporate website for, for any, reference at any time or for the public to reference. Um, um, there's a, some notable changes that we've made in the, and I, I'm, I'm just sticking with the, the first three years of the program and, and I will, I'll begin with that. And uh, if council's all wait, okay with that, that's, I would like to just highlight some of these changes and that just kind of bring them to council's attention. And, uh, and then I'll turn to each of the, the applicable departmental staff to, to speak to theirs and, uh, and we'll go from there. So. Okay. Carry on. Okay. Uh, for, so for uh, in table two, the, um, starting off finance here, um, what's new, and we've added $100,000 under finance for our corporate procurement software and implementation, and uh, we put that into the program for, for 2021, um, or it's new to the program for 2021. Um, the county does not have an electronic PO system. Um, um, it, has been on our, our radar for a bit, but I have to mention with COVID-19 and the amount of requests for electronic POs and, and things like that, and trying to keep track of the commitments and stuff, it came to the realization it's it's time that we, we need to move in this in this factor. So we've we've put this in here. It's being funded from reserves, but it's being included, but it's, I just wanted to bring it to council's attention that it's something new that wasn't in the plan last year. The, uh, the multi-user budgeting software is the second item I just want to highlight under finance and uh, that was uh, we're moving that back. Um, we're currently just entering into our agreement on our work management software for transportation services and with and along with a, a, a procurement software I'm going to push it back. It's just be too much too much at once for for staff to to implement together. So 
So then for the next item on human resources, I'll, I'll turn this over to, to Grant McClevey to speak to. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, through you, Mr. Warden, good morning, Council. There's a couple of notable items in here uh, for human resources. We have the service review that is ongoing actually right now. And also the job hazards and demands analysis is something that we're continuing to move forward with. It's a, it's a great program. There's three other pieces on this uh, capital budget. It's corporate scheduling software, human resources software, and the market salary review. Given that what we're uh, going through right now with the organizational review, we are uh, thinking of holding off on these uh, pieces and we continue to put money into the budget for it. But uh, especially the software replacements, we think that uh, this is not the right year. Uh, we're continuing on with it. And again, with the market salary review, we are uh, going to be putting that on hold likely for another couple of years. Um, those are really just the, the notable pieces in this uh, small capital budget. Okay, thanks, Grant. Next, I'd like uh, Jody McCracken from IT to speak to the notable changes on information technology. Um, I will highlight some of the projects that we've uh, either introduced or increased our budget planning for uh, in this capital plan. Um, so one of the new things we've added is ongoing security audits on a four-year cycle. Um, given how fast cybersecurity changes and what that landscape looks like and the amount of resources we have to throw at it, we consider that a fairly uh, critical resource to bring in. Um, we are trying to make that uh, the timing with those um, sort of mesh with our IT strategy plans, which were already in the capital plan as well. Both of these tend to give us um, a lot of work, you know, big lists of little things to do and slightly smaller lists of larger projects. They are really important to have done. Um, we want to make sure that we have time to um, We had telephone system upgrades planned for this year. Um, that's a project that, uh, well, it was slow to uh, even get started. We had a consultant planned as well. And just based on where those costs are going to come out, and given everything that's happened this year, we've decided to push those back. So we plan on using the consultant next year to make recommendations on what we are going to need for a telephone system, what sort of the business requirements are, and help to develop an RFP, and also just review the accounts that we have with our carriers. Um, you know, especially if we are doing anything at all that's comparable to current work situations with, um, you know, more people working remotely and less at the office, it's going to be uh, very helpful to have someone come in and kind of make some recommendations for us and what we can do with the technology. We also had a project in this year for long-term care server replacements. Um, when we started to look at that project, we um, initially found so Jody, Jody, just for just, can you make sure you're speaking into your mic clearly because you're coming in and out? Okay. Um, I think that might be my computer because I'm already pretty close, but I will slow down and hope it's clear. Um, we had planned on replacing the servers at each of our long-term care homes, and that was going to be significantly more expensive than we planned, um, in, in part because of our planning. We didn't have uh, some of the software and licensing required. We were just looking at hardware and a like-for-like -like replacement. And so for our budget planning and transparency, we have included that uh, properly budgeted for next year. However, um, even since then in our ongoing negotiations with Dell, um, it, it would be far more um, effective or cost effective to do that this year. So I am going to bring a report to the next council session. Um, on what that would look like if we do it this year and, and ask to proceed with it. The ongoing costs and the lifespan um, in the council or sorry in the capital project are correct for that project for, for the 10 years other than this year where we would see costs. We've tried to balance some of these increases um, in, in the budget with technology choices to make sure we are getting the most cost effective um, you know, choices when we go uh, to market or getting the most um, return on our investments. So we have uh, really assessed our lifespans in IT technology. It doesn't have the longest lifespan. A lot of times it's five or seven years at the most. Um, 
So we've made sure that things like our switches and wireless access points, we're planning on going to the seven year replacement cycle with them. Um, some of our core network infrastructure, we currently will all unlock the vendor one supported path for five years. Um, and the big part will be the licensing anyways. So we're still planning, <clears throat> pardon me, on five year life cycles for those. And there's a couple of other projects where we have been able to reduce the costs. Over the last few years, the orthophotography program that we participate in with the province has been a lot cheaper than it was 10 years ago. So we're showing those costs reduced. And uh, our plan now is to continue with the same technology we have for wireless internet or wireless access points, which should be cheaper than we had planned in the previous capital budget. That's it for my team. Do you have any questions? I guess, Jody, just with regards to uh, a comment that our CAO made a few months back leading into COVID-19, is with County Council uh, the next term uh, moving from, or whenever that will be moving from iPads back to laptops or whatever. And I'm not sure if you're capturing that or not. Uh, no, traditionally it has been the clerk's budgets that have uh, oh. <laughs> provided council with hardware. And certainly if that's a conversation of what technology best serves council, if that's a conversation you want to have, then we're certainly open to it. Well, I think the, uh, I think Madam CEO mentioned it a, a few months back when we're in, into technology and working from home, uh, it has been a challenge with the iPads and, and I don't want to talk too much about that, but I was just wondering if it was in this category, but if it's in the clerk's department, we can certainly have further conversation there for sure. Sure. Okay, any questions from county councillors with regards to the uh, information technology? All right, well, we know, Jody, that's always changing all the time. That's a very fast moving uh, area that you work in, it's exciting. And uh, I think you need one new switch there, just on the volume. <laughs> anyway, said, Mr. Warden, I was just going to say that if if Jody was looking for more money for to work from home better, he's done a good job this morning because I didn't hear half of what he said. But I'm sure <laughs> it's all important. Yeah, I know, and and certainly, uh, um, I, I know he, it was it was a little harder to hear. But if uh, if you do have further questions, certainly follow up with Jody if there's something that uh, that's on there for sure. Madam CEO, did you? Uh, I see you're off mute. I just don't know you're wanting to speak or not. The only to confirm with you, Mr. Warden, that we will not lose track of the transition from iPads to notebooks yeah. for council. Yeah. No. Okay. So there's no questions there then. Uh, back to you, uh, Kevin. Yeah. And I'll turn it over to Randy now. He'll talk to, talk to the planning component of, of the tenure capital. Randy. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, good morning, council. Uh, in terms of changes made to the capital plan associated with the planning department projects for 2021, based on the previously approved 10 year capital, the one change being proposed is to increase the development charges five year review from 50,000 to 60,000. And this is based on recent development charge review prices from other municipalities, as well as based on changes to the development charges act and the new community benefit charges. Uh, the majority of the DC review is funded by development charges as well as from a planning reserve and therefore there are no increases to the proposed levy. It's still $2,000 proposed uh, from the levy to, uh, to support that project. The, the other notable change is that we're proposing to move the age-friendly community strategic action plan from the initial proposed start date of this year to starting the project in early 2021. This study involves quite a bit of consultation and given the current restrictions associated with the pandemic and staff resources as a result of the pandemic, we felt the best to pause the study to commence in early 2021. We had anticipated this project likely wouldn't start until later this year. So we're probably only delaying the start of this project by a few months. Um, so those are the notable changes uh, with respect to planning related projects. Okay, Randy, any questions to the, the planning department from County Council? All right, back to you, Kevin. Yeah, I'll turn it over now to Savannah Myers. Um, she'll speak to tourism and gray routes. Perfect. Good morning. Uh, the tourism addition in here, the tourism signage, it was originally part of our operating budget. So we thought for longer term planning, it made a lot of sense to bring it into capital. And there's also some potential to leverage RTO7 funding through this. So that's part of why we brought it into capital instead of operating so that we could uh, 
start a really good program. We, especially now, we know more than ever, signage is becoming very important as uh, we don't have as many ambassadors out on the road uh, being able to direct. So that is why uh, that's a brand new to capital program, but it has always been part of our operating. For gray routes, the general store was originally planned for 2020, but uh, we bumped that back to 2021. And it is our hope to keep it in 2021, given the work that's going to be happening next door with the demonstration, the opportunities that will be there uh, to be able to really bring the store to life seem like an, an, an excellent timing. So that is fully funded by Preserve um, for Grey Roots. Replacing drywall in the temporary exhibition hall. Um, Ted has let us know that there are many, many layers of paint on that uh, drywall and it is time to be replaced. But because we're not making changes this year due to COVID and our closure, we are able to bump that out by an extra year. Uh, so that has been pushed back to 2022. Replacing the heat pumps, um, thanks to some regular maintenance that uh, Ted's done in the last uh, year, we've also been able to bump that project from next year to 2022. Um, they will survive to that uh, point, but they will need to be replaced, the heat pumps at Grey Roots, and that is the price for all six. Um, for our economic development strategy for tourism and culture, we're going to develop a, a full master plan for the full department with all three now together. Um, so that project has been moved forward to 2022 so that we can align all three departments. And what is notable throughout our capital for all three departments is that we are asking for one third of that to go towards consultation and consultants and the other two thirds to be put directly to immediate action planning and uh, implementation. So that has been bumped up so that we can better align across all three and find some economies of scale. In terms of rooftop units, both of those have been bumped to better align with flat roof replacing. It makes sense if we're going to be replacing the roof to replace the rooftop units at the same time. We do know that they will survive to that point also because they are in good working repair. Uh, so they've been moved back out of 2021 to two different years in 2023 and 2024. And the last notable item that we had had planned for 2022 was the building of the church. But if we're going to start building a store in 2021, that is too close uh, to be able to do that. We need some time in between to make sure that we are well planning and well prepared. So we have bumped that out uh, for two years to 2024. Uh, so those are the notable changes between tourism and Grey Roots. Okay, thanks, Savannah. Any questions for County Council? I had a question, Mr. Warden. Go ahead, Council Mon. In regards to uh, the projects at Gray Roots, uh, given you know there's there's no activity at Gray Roots be currently because of the uh, pandemic, um, you know, wouldn't it be better to try to bring some stuff forward, much like we are with the floor, to try to get stuff done, and then it would be a reduction of disruption when we uh, are open to the public again. Savannah. Yes, that is a great question. So we did do that with a flat roof replacement that's happening right now. And then the lobby floor that you uh, just endorsed for us through the consent agenda, uh, as well as starting the gallery uh, demolition. So we are doing a gallery refresh inside in the big main gallery. Uh, so that is going to be happening while we are closed so that we're not going to cause too much disruption. Uh, the other projects, we're quite confident that we'll be able to manage the site to not cause a lot of disruption and a lot will happen on the roof and elsewhere. Our carpet's also being done this year because that is exactly where our staff would be seated. So that will happen uh, while they are out of the building. So certainly uh, we have moved some projects up, but some make more sense down the line and we think that we'll be able to keep them separate. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's a good question. All right, any other questions to Savannah? All right, hearing none, Kevin. Right, next, I'll uh, ask Barb Fetty uh, to speak to uh, social services and childcare. Welcome, Barb. Good morning, County Council, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, social services is um, primarily a people service program. We're made up of uh, Ontario Works and Children's Services. So the capital that you're seeing are, um, is with regard to our early on center in Hanover. Um, we've been um, contributing to um, a reserve for to meet accessibility needs for 2025 to be AODA compliant. Um, you'll see a change there. Uh, we are looking at currently at whether or not the purpose built building that we are in from the 70s is uh, the future of early on. So early on child and family services. So what we're looking for is um, uh, 
just to, to be sure to continue to make sure that the building stays in good condition. You can see that we do have some um, projects this year. We've got some flooring. We've got some, um, uh, we're still contributing to uh, the improvements based on the, the building uh, capital uh, assessment, uh, building conditioning assessment, sorry. And um, we are um, still looking at making sure that we're meeting the ceiling replacement in 2021. Uh, we did move a few things back, uh, just given the fact that we are uncertain as to where we will be in the future. Um, the, if you're not familiar with the site, it's located in a very residential neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned, it was purpose built as a child care center. And so given the, the nature of the child and family um, program transition under Ministry of Education, where uh, the early on family centers for, for adults and children um, we think that there's an opportunity for us to look at a future state. And so we are taking advantage of this time of closure right now when the center is closed to do some of the work in 2020 that was scheduled. And then you'll see some changes for 2021. Um, that is all I have for capital. Okay, any questions to Barb? County Council. All righty, Kevin. Thank you, Barb. Thanks. Next, Anne Marie Shaw, the Director of Housing, will speak to the housing. And Good morning, County Council. Oh, you just muted yourself. <laughs> Not sure how I did that. So the majority of our challenge or the majority of our changes that are outlined in this document are um, from moving projects from this year to the next year and, and uh, sort of a ripple effect uh, after. Uh, we had a number of projects listed this year that we had to go into our tenants units in order to do um, because of the pandemic we are not uh, able to do that. Um, also we had a little bit of a later start um, in the year um, of course with a couple months of, of not knowing um, whether to put tenders out or whatnot. So we had a look at our um, projects for next year and um, ones that we felt really had to be done for next year we've kept and otherwise what we have done is moved a number of projects from 2020 to 2021. Um, so with this year the projects that we had to move um, we did look at our asphalt and our parking we had a number of parking lots that were being done we felt that this was one that we could easily move to next year group together and it wouldn't be a very large um, undertaking is large undertaking we also had asphalt projects scheduled for 2021 so now they're all together so we'll be able to tender them all at once um, we had bath rebuilds and, and exterior, exterior and interior doors again moving those to 2021 um, due to um, COVID-19 this year uh, bathroom rebuilds the same um, some of the projects that we did add or an increase are common room furniture. Uh, the common room furniture that we have is from the 70s and 80s. A lot of it is not fire uh, retardant, so we are moving towards uh, furniture that will meet uh, the fire code. Um, we have worked with our local fire departments and um, worked out that over the next few years we will be looking at removing uh, those furnitures and, and um, putting in with something that's uh, uh, more appropriate. Um, uh, hot water tanks, um, just an annual, this is an annual um, item that we have. If we have a hot water tank that um, we have to replace, uh, then we're able to do that. Uh, and we have funds available for it. We did put an increase there just because there has been an increase in the, in the pre price of hot water tanks. Uh, we have um, a retaining wall that we have added in. We've actually moved that as a new. Um, we do have a retaining wall at one of our um, apartments at, in our Dundalk at 40 Artemisia Street. Um, that is in need of some work. So we have moved that as a new project for next year. Um, and also kitchen replacements at Victoria Village. Um, that project uh, we did when we um, took over Victoria Village and Golden Town, we did receive some capital funding that they, was already in existence. Um, and so that capital funding will be put towards um, Victoria Village kitchen replacements and that's for 2022. Um, moving forward, the majority of the changes are again are just sort of that ripple effect from um, jobs being put from 20 to 21 to 22. And I'd be happy to answer any questions from council. Okay, thanks, Anne-Marie. Any questions from uh, County Council? No, I don't hear anything, Sam Marie and uh, Kevin. Yeah, the next is uh, long term care. So I'll ask Jennifer Cornell to, to just highlight some of the notables. 
morning, Jennifer. Hey, good, good morning. Council, my internet has been unstable is the message that I'm getting. So I'm not going to attempt to turn the camera on and uh, someone interrupt if I freeze up and you can't hear me anymore. Uh, so I will uh, go through the notable changes uh, home by home. Uh, Green Gables, there is a, a couple of projects that have been impacted by COVID-19 and we're, they're being moved forward to 2021. That's the laundry equipment and the retaining wall. Uh, the, and then a, a couple of projects have been moved um, to happen sooner and that's uh, surface drainage and eaves trough project, the uh, main entrance doors. Those projects are moving forward. They need to be done sooner. Uh, they, they had, uh, well, doors has a security impact and the surface drainage and eaves trough product uh, project impacts uh, our tenant space and uh, if there's a lot of rain and uh, and groundwater then there there is can be some flooding at times so uh, we think that that will resolve that problem uh, the parking lot curbs and guards project is actually being moved back to coincide with the, the hospital build and the potential long-term care redevelopment and then a couple of new projects uh, windowsill replacement and plumbing fixture replacement. They had traditionally been part of the operating budget, uh, but the project has become big enough that uh, we felt it was uh, important to add it to capital and, uh, and get ahead of it. Uh, and then alternatively, two projects are being uh, moved back into operating and that's the painting of common rooms and hallways and, uh, and the recalking projects. So that's Gray Gables. Green Manor, uh, and again, a couple of projects impacted by, the, by COVID-19. So the renovation of the resident common area and staff areas on the main floor are being pushed back to 2021. A new project, uh, a couple of new projects in um, the addition of blanket and towel warmers uh, and some furniture and drapery replacements to, uh, and to bring the home uh, up, up to speed with the, the competitors and uh, the furniture and drapes are definitely nearing the end of service. So those are new projects. And then recalking has also been uh, put back into operating. At Rockwood Terrace, the, the only additions are um, reducing the funding for a project. So uh, blanket and towel warmers has been reduced uh, by $8,400 and, and that's because there was a, some donations uh, last year that allowed for a blanket and towel warmer to be purchased last year and so one less is required uh, as that project and um, to align with the other three homes the reclocking project is put into operating. The, the blanket and towel warmers are, are something that we tried um, a couple of years ago, see how it impacted the residents and, and how useful were they. So we, we piloted one per home and they are so well received by residents. So it's, it's like a little heating box that, that heats the towels and or blankets. And um, if someone is chilled or not feeling well or have some responsive behaviors, it's kind of like a warm hug is how I heard uh, one nurse describe it. And so we thought that that was important to have accessible on every home area. And that was good thinking because COVID-19, we're trying to minimize the, the traffic and the, the movement of items and people from home area to home area. So uh, I think it's a, a worthwhile project to add. So those are uh, the notable highlights for long-term care. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Jennifer. Are there any questions from County Council? I have a question, Mr. Warden. Go ahead. Uh, it's in regards to uh, Greg Gables, uh, Jennifer, the parking lot curbs and guards. I note, as you mentioned, that uh, you're putting it back to 2024 to coincide with the hospital build. I admire your optimism, but I wouldn't let that project slide too long because uh, I, I, I'm not a big gambler, but I would hazard to guess that the hospital will not be built by 2024. It'll be built by 2022. <laughs> uh, well that's not optimism that's delusion so but you, you hold on to that you hold on to that mr warden well, uh, you will. Uh, i'll keep an eye on that thank you yes yes we will we definitely will it's uh it's certainly something that we are watching very closely 
Thanks to that, Councilor Millen. Is there any other questions then to uh, Jennifer? All right, Kevin. Good morning, County Council. Uh, for paramedic services, uh, some notable changes in our capital. Uh, the first one is our cardiac monitor defibrillators, which are due to be purchased in 2023. They have a seven year life span. Um, what we wanna do here is have one cardiac monitor def defibrillator for each responding unit, uh, just from staff on the road operations, having them available in each unit helps, especially a change of shift if a uh, crew's on overtime to ensure each unit has a uh, defibrillator, cardiac monitor defibrillator available for them to be able to go out and uh, respond um, we particularly feel the pressure if one or the two units are down and requiring service, uh, and this will help uh, during that time as well if a couple are out for service. The second one is our emergency response trailer. Um, that trailer was purchased in 2010, and uh, just with uh, being stored inside and the, and the good service that we receive at the trans from the transportation folks, uh, we uh, have pushed that out uh, to a 20 year replacement. We've had the mechanics look at it and we're comfortable that we can make it extend to uh, 2030. Uh, the next one is a, a substantial change for us, but uh, we're looking at uh, building a new base in Durham. The current base there is, uh, we lease it, it was built in the mid 80s. And uh, it's one over the years, uh, even since we started in, in, the, in 04, uh, through the years, uh, we've had issues with ventilation, mold, temperature control, equipment storage, uh, just appropriate places to uh, to clean our equipment. And uh, so what we're looking at doing is uh, is, is uh, putting money away with a potential build for uh, 2025 on the, on the grounds of the new Rockwood Terrace. Um, the next one, uh, tablet uh, computers for ambulances. Uh, we're looking at moving that project up one year. Our computers were to be replaced in 2022. And what we're finding, and it, this has been an ongoing concern and it's not just here, but it, and each year we, we try to find the best technology for the in and out, because the computers come in and out of that dock each day and multiple times. They have to be taken into calls. They're out of car accidents doing sign offs. They're uh, taken into the base to, to do uh, uh, their, their work that in and out uh, um, has affected the impact of the, uh, the docking station. And what happens is, is the docking station, the little pins on it can actually become bent and that uh, blows the circuit board in the dock as well, potentially uh, blows the keyboard. So the plan is, is what we would do is use this year's computers and lock them in those docks permanently. Uh, we have done that somewhat right now by blocking, it's a split computer and a screen and a keyboard but this would permanently lock that in there. We would use those computers uh, for our CAD interface, which we are pretty close to getting going across the system now. And we would purchase computers that would be stored in a cabinet that could be uh, charged and it would be uh, secured. And uh, they, they would ultimately end up with one fixed computer and then one uh, uh, computer that they can take in and out and do whatever they need to do for documenting. There will be a savings because we won't have to buy the docking stations uh, so I don't believe there'll be really any difference in the costing if with us we reusing the docking stations because they're they're approximately fifteen hundred dollars a piece and then whatever the installation costs are. So there actually could be some savings in that area and it would also give us better service. And the last uh, notable change is this year uh, where we are we, we were including Cadsworth uh, in the uh, building condition assessment. So we're looking at. Uh, putting money away for re future repairs for that building as well. And that's uh, the changes for paramedic services that are notable. Okay, thanks, uh, Kevin. Are there any questions to, uh, to this department from County Council? I see Councillor Hicks has his yeah. hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Deputy Warden, Councillor Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I would just comment that I'm really, really happy to see a plan for a new paramedic base in Durham, um, uh, that, that's very, very much needed. I would have uh, liked to have seen it uh, earlier than 2025, but nevertheless, it's good to just see it on the radar. Yeah, and with us securing that land as well, it's a, an opportunity for other other projects as well, maybe. So thanks for that. Uh, any other comments? All right, thank you, uh, Kevin. And back to you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I'll turn it over now to, to Pat Hoyt to speak to the transportation services. 
Thank you, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Kevin through, and Mr. Warden, uh, through you. Um, I, I just wanted to mention a couple things about, uh, about our 10 year plan. Um, the thing, the kind of the goal we really have when we set out to do it, one thing we, we kind of come up, you know, everything deteriorates at a different rate. So, you know, one job might be really kind of scheduled in 23 and there's another job close by in 24. So you'll notice uh, like in the map link, uh, there's a link up to the map on page 97 of your package. Um, this is kind of complicated because there's so many handouts and sheets and we don't have the maps that you normally have. But um, you'll notice that a lot of times um, something will shift one year. So, you know, rather than go back to the same basic proximity two years in a row, we'll put two jobs together and try to get economies of scale that way. So you'll notice we kind of do that around Katy. Um, there's a bunch of jobs in 2025 kind of in Blue Mountains, over near Gray Highlands, Gray Road 40 and Gray Road 2, we've kind of put them together. Um, jobs in uh, Georgian Bluffs, we've kind of put together because you're already there. So you'll see a lot of that in our, in our uh, package. And one more thing I wanted to mention, a couple of years ago, we started always doing two lifts of asphalt. It's made a big difference in how, how our roads are looking after a couple of years uh, with the truck traffic, they really need that extra structure. So, and this year we've kind of looked into adding a lot of uh, microsurfacing. So for example, Gray Road 40, we paved it last year. We're going back in 2029 to do some microsurfacing just to seal that top and, and stop the initial cracking. So, and one other thing you'll notice in here is a lot of overlays. We still have a lot of those um, old roads from when we were only doing one lift. When we're in the area, we're trying to maybe put another lift on of asphalt to get that pavement structure we need. So I'm gonna start on page 91 here just go through some of these projects and some of the changes that have come about. Uh, one to notice, uh, kind of the second one down is that structure in West Gray that we had uh, put off this year because of COVID and timing and all that type of thing. It actually kind of works out for us because there's another uh, uh, bridge right in the area. So we'll probably end up tendering those together. Um, probably be good for a contractor because he could be working, one could be curing while he's working on the other and it, it kind of works out really well for us actually. So those jobs will be coming out next year. Uh, the Orchardville Bridge, we've moved off a year. The design is pretty much done, but it's just too tight this year. There's some uh, hydro work to do, and um, we just were too close to the window this year, so we're going to do it next year. The next bunch of jobs is all jobs around Katy, uh, north and south of Katy, or north, north and west of Katy, I guess. Um, same thing, just jobs in the area, they all need to be done. They were kind of within a year of each other, and we've kind of tried to lump them together just to take advantage of the economies of scale. So I'm on to page 92. Um, the second last one there is, is, uh, is the big 19 and 21 job. So I will be coming forward with a report in uh, two more council sessions about this, but um, the plan right now is the, it's with the utilities. They're, they're making their designs. We're hoping to move the utilities in 2021 and then uh, construction in 2022 and 23. So it's a huge job and um, we also have to get some things straightened out uh, with a pumping station that uh, it's a town of Blue Mountains pumping station, but we have to move it because of the roundabout. There's no agreement on who's paying for it yet, so we're going to work with the town on that. Um, the bottom of page 92, you see that 170. That was one of the roads we paved with one lift. We're in the area at 17, so we put that extra lift in there, that million dollars to put the top lift of that road on. On to page 93. Um, one thing worth noticing about the fifth one down, uh, Gray Road 13 in Clarksburg, we've coordinated that with our depot. We're paving our depot that year. It's, it's a smaller job, but we thought, let's try to do them both together. Um, the one below that, Gray Road 17B, it was originally one project. We divided it into two. The uh, piece through Nichols Gully has some design challenges and uh, some property that we're probably gonna have to get. So we really wanted to do the east-west section first. So we're gonna do that. Uh, sooner and then in 2021 and then the next section will come back in Nichols Gully and do 2022. Uh, the, the uh, I guess third one up from the bottom, the structure, the fiber wrap, we took a report for that about a month ago um, or maybe two months now, but uh, that's just, we're waiting the study to see what year that's going to go. We're probably going to do, we're going to do it sometime. We just don't know when. So it's kind of a placeholder for now. Uh, on to page 90. Four, at the very top, there's our Gray Road three and four uh, funded roundabout, which we're very excited about. The RFP is ready to go. Um, we're gonna put it out any day now and uh, get a consultant on board for that. So we actually, uh, kudos to the, uh, the people uh, administering the grant. They actually gave us time to get it together. 
We've been saying that for every grant for a long time, and it's really nice to have a long window to work with the EA process and everything. So uh, we're really happy with that. Uh, you'll see the fifth one down. We've got uh, $5 million for the four laning of Gray Road uh, 19. We put out a traffic study last year because it's been in our DCs for a long time, but we never really had a study saying, yes, you definitely need to do the four laning. So it has been confirmed and uh, the Blue Mountains residents, of course, could tell us it's very busy. Um, so uh, as of in a couple weeks or, you know, in four weeks with this uh, next report I come with, there's a lot of little moving parts um, in 19 and 21 that we're working on trying to get everything coordinated as best we can. Um, on to page, I guess there is page 95. We should have said this page uh, is intentionally blank, but anyway, on to page 96. So I'm going to go on to uh, the depots and domes. The very first, we have uh, Dundalk uh, Dome still needs some repairs. Oh, actually, does anyone have any questions about the construction and capital first? Any questions from County Council? Councillor Deputy Warden, Councillor Hicks. Sorry, just uh, can you explain what is the fiber wrap? on page 93, what is that? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Warden, yeah, there's uh, um, some cracking on, on that structure that uh, is just a, a little bit concerning, um, that it hasn't been totally analyzed what exactly it is, or, or how severe it is, I should say. So uh, there's visual cracking there that we can see. It's basically just a fiberglass wrap. Um, and it, it really, uh, it shockingly really increases the strength of a bridge that needs it uh, pretty significantly. So um, we, you kind of get to that point where you know what you have isn't quite going to be what you need. But the next step to go to a full replacement is way more than what the bridge wrap is going to get us. So that's, that's why we've gone with that um, option. But we're studying it right now to see what year we need. Okay, thanks, Pat. Are there any other questions up till now from County Mr. Council? Mr. Warden, I see Ms. Uh, Councillor Millen and Councillor Potter. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Millen and then Councillor Potter after that. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I, I thought page 95 was all the projects that we'd be doing in Own Sound this year, but I, I'm glad you clarified that. Um, the question I had was uh, uh, in regards to the wrap as well. Um, I recall a number of years ago, it was proposed to put some kind of hybrid fix onto a road on a trail in Chatsworth and we were uh, soundly uh, victimized for even proposing that and we went ahead with a full bridge replacement and fixture. Uh, I'm wondering, um, are you confident that this wrap technique will uh, serve uh, the bridge uh, into the future? Yeah, we are. It's, it's used by a lot of, uh, lot of agencies and um, they, everyone's had quite good success with it. Um, there's some on the, uh, on the gardener, probably not the best example if you see the gardener, but the areas that are wrapped look fine. But anyway, um, yeah, we're very confident it's going to work out and we're, you know, we're a ways from tendering it, obviously, but uh, yeah, we're pretty comfortable on the technology. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Councillor Potter, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, through you, Pat. Uh, is COVID having much of an effect on the prices of materials and, and so on uh, as you look ahead? And, and I don't know if your crystal ball is any newer than mine, but uh, I just wondered if, if you have any idea what the impacts are going to be in the short term. And, and then as we look out through the years of this forecast. Thank you, through you, Mr. Warden. Yeah, we, we, all we can kind of say is this year, we know we got really good prices, right? Oil's low, so asphalt's really reasonable this year, we've noticed. Uh, the AC index hasn't come out yet. We don't really know exactly the price of asphalt till we already paved, so till a month after you paved. But um, you would think there's expenses for our contractors. We've noticed they all have COVID plans in place. There's all more spacing. Um, you know, you might need a few more guys. You're not having three guys necessarily in the same truck all the time. Um, you would think ongoing there'd be an expense. I don't know if that's overpowered by the fact that they really need the work this year. Um, so this year it seems like we got re really good prices, but if you really have to change, it's hard to do work when you're all six feet apart, right? So um, I, could see, uh, I could see there being an increase in price in the future, but it's hard for me to tell. They'd know better than me, I guess. You sure to your volume there at the end there, Pat, was a little in and out there. So I'm not oh, sure. was it? Okay. Yeah. I'll have to tell uh, IT. 
Yeah. <laughs> Something to do with those switches again. I guess um, so. Uh, any other questions then uh, from, uh, oh, go ahead, Councillor Mackey. I see you. Go ahead. Thanks, Warden. And through you to Pat. Pat, I'm just wondering if the uh, transportation master plan, is it dead in the water or can council expect the resurrection of it? And how does it uh, plan into your long-term forecast? Uh, no, it is not dead. That is uh, actually, I have a meeting with uh, Kim coming up. I'm sure that is the first thing she will mention. Um, the uh, connecting link and the exchanges are still alive and we're kind of working on them and we got to get them moving uh, ASAP. Uh, it doesn't really come into our planning right now. Um, we're kind of going with the network we got, but it will as soon as those reports come forward. Thank you. Okay. Question? Any other comments uh, up to this point with regards to construction of roads? And I know, Pat, sometimes that, that varies every year depending on circumstances and certain roads that all of a sudden need higher priority, right? Yes, that's, that's right. Okay, carry on then. Okay, I'll go over the facilities and uh, depots. So, you know, most of the stuff is the same. A couple changes. Um, there's some uh, uh, dome repairs in Dundalk that we'll need to do. That being said, we don't plan on being there for the long haul. Um, just to let you know, the patrol D, we still have not acquired the land around Flesherton somewhere for the new, uh, the new site. Um, it's been a little more difficult than we were anticipating. It's, uh, we're still, we're still on the search for that. So um, I've got to get some information to Southgate about that dome to see what we're going to end up doing with it. If the town's interested in it or that's kind of on, uh, on my list of things to do um, to figure out what we're going to do. We don't want to pour a bunch of money into something we're not going to have, but um, they are pretty necessary repairs for 2021 that we're planning on doing. We don't want your uh, rotten secondhand uh, goods. That's for sure. <laughs> you better fix it good. I, I, go ahead, Councillor Millen. You're speaking there. Go ahead. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. I, I, I okay. that up. There's nothing wrong with that, Mike. Mr. Warden, he yeah. sounds like a crabby old man now. <laughs> okay, carry on, Pat. Carry on. Okay, uh, on to machinery now. So there's a couple new things in here. One is the purchase of uh, two new half-ton trucks, basically for the mechanics. Over the years, um, we kind of got away from having a truck specifically for the mechanics. And we find ourselves in a situation now where they're always kind of trying to grab a spare one around if they have to run out, you know, someone's truck breaks down or there's problems with the grader or whatever. Um, and sometimes there's no truck there. The area foreman might not be working that day or whatever. So uh, we really want to add two uh, um, half tons to our fleet. Um, Calvin has gone through and kind of figured out what our charger rates are going to be to keep that equipment reserve um, where it needs to be. So that that's one big difference is uh, two new half tons that we're going to get having the patrol. Oh, just, just on that, would you would you just go with a regular uh, half ton, or would you sort of go a little bit more so we could carry some tools and stuff so then at least when they get there they have something to work with versus just a half ton or you feel that's adequate yeah we're gonna it'll be a regular half ton but we'll we'll definitely get something uh, on the back of a box of some sort so they can have their tools in there it would be nice for yeah. them yeah you wouldn't want to have to load your tools in and out every time you got to go somewhere right no no I, and i'm just thinking for weights and stuff like that uh, yeah. if a half ton is adequate versus a three quarter ton or for pulling and right. or, or do you need you know so okay Carry on. Um, the second item on there is the purchase of tandem trucks. So that that is uh, all dealing with the uh, contract with Harold Sutherland, of course, who's been uh, bought out uh, by Walker. So their two routes are up in April 22. We have our tender with them that uh, they do those two routes in Georgia Bluffs. So we put this in here. Uh, we have a report that has to come forward yet. We're kind of working on the, uh, um, the cost benefit of all those type of things. But we got a really, really good price from Harold Sutherland at the time. Um, I think it was, you know, maybe a little more than half of what uh, the Miller bid was. So uh, we're, we're worried that if we tender that again, we might not get that same price as, as uh, you know, whether or not Sutherland has, you know, is the same people bidding as a Walker, uh, Walker company now. So we don't know. But uh, we put it in here as uh, probably proposed to bring those back into our program to have them operated by Gray County. Um, nice consistency of service and that I'm not going to go too far into it because Steve uh, Dahlmeyer, our new maintenance manager, will have a report coming on on that. But right now we thought we should put it in there in case we end up taking those two routes back. 
Uh, the next one down is the great all. We had it in there um, 400 and uh, yeah, 400,000. Uh, the great alls have really gone up a lot. Um, so we've got a more uh, accurate figure. One other thing we did, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to committee before, we were looking into maybe a rubber tire excavator because we had, you know, our, our, uh, our fleet committee kind of said, well, we could probably use an excavator and maybe that would be better than the great all. And um, we've kind of been studying that for basically a year. And uh, what we've kind of come up with was that the great all is a licensed piece of equipment. It's, um, and I know the, the uh, member municipalities all have, uh, a lot of them have rubber tire excavators and they really like them. Um, but for us, I think with our, uh, our, our geography and how uh, large the county is, it just doesn't get around that well. Um, whereas mm -hmm. our great all is a licensed uh, piece of equipment that can basically drive at highway speed. But we also looked that we're not really using the attachments that are available for it. Um, so we, we want to stick with the great all and this will be our new one that we would purchase. But we will also want to get a lot more attachments for attachments for brushing and attachments uh, you know, for uh, doing behind guide rail. And some of the things that a great all really doesn't do now, uh, we think with the attachments, it would be a, even a better piece of equipment, but generally uh, the great all works well for us. So we've got a more accurate figure on what we're gonna spend. And the do last one is five, just, oh, sorry. Uh, do you have thought, uh, any issues with people learning how to drive uh, a great all? Like I know it's sort of a unique piece of equipment, but do you have that, uh, is, that is that ever an issue with people learning how to drive it? Yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Warden. Yeah, uh, we're really seeing it this year, actually, because we had uh, uh, a 40 year employee has been operating our great all for years and years and years and just an absolute expert at it. He, uh, he's been off uh, uh, lately with some medical issues, but um, we have two new guys doing it this year. Um, so they're kind of doing half days. And uh, actually, it's kind of a good system because um, whoever's in the great all, the other the other worker is doing the grades of the ditches. So, you know, you're either operating the machine or you're watching the machine operate and trying to figure out what you want it to do. So um, they've come a long way this year, I think, and, uh, and they are getting the hang of it for sure. Uh, the last thing is that Ontario uh, works passenger van. That'll be, um, you know, some of those programs are, um, we're just, uh, we had moved it back because it was, we weren't sure if it was gonna be funded or not. I, um, they can talk more about that than me, but. Um, that's just a change that we made. Okay. Well, thanks, Pat. I see that's the end of your list, right? Yeah. Is there any questions from county councillors? Okay. I'm going to take this back to you, Kevin. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah. Um, I know that notable items pages pages are a lot longer than normal. And a lot of that is to relationship to COVID-19. So I um, apologize for that. Um, we, we try to do these notable items in the first three years just as, you know, as a courtesy and trying to keep the public informed that if you're out, um, you know, just telling a, a rate pair that a project's going to happen in a certain year and then, and then it gets changed, we want to try, especially in the next three years, we want to try to bring that to your attention. So that's, that's why we've done it this way. Um, I know previous years that uh, we ran into instances of that where a rate pair thought a road was going to get repaired next year and it wasn't and the counselor wasn't aware that it had been changed. So this is our attempt to try to keep everybody informed about those notable changes. Okay. Uh, so um, staff is recommending this forecast be received uh, and uh, in the first year be used for the, the 2021 annual budget. And uh, if there's uh, any items that need to, to come forward in advance that staff would be authorized to procure that, but they're going to have to come back to council uh, with a report requesting to go to tender for that and, uh, and, and get a resolution to approve that. So, so it is a, it is a, just a planning document. It's, uh, it's not an approved budget anymore. It's just a planning for staff and to, to try to, to inform everyone uh, what, what our future plans are here. So thank you. Thanks Kevin. And it's great to have that. And I know it's a living document and as, as time changes, things sometimes change too, but, uh, it's the best you can do. And that's great. Any questions from County Councilors again on the whole report? Again, that was moved by Councilor Burley and Mr. Warden. Mackey. Go ahead. Just in uh, it's just a general question, Kevin, uh, regarding uh, the increase uh, for uh, for 2021, and in fact, the next two or three years. Um, 
for instance, next year's increase is 1.43. Um, and I'm not sure, you maybe touched on it, but is inflation factored into that number? Um, I, I note that, you know, the year over year January increase of this year was, or yeah, this year the CPI was almost twice that. And I'm just wondering whether those percentage increases is enough to keep up realistically given the rate of inflation. Kevin? Yeah, it's a good question. No, we, we have like, um, for example, in our facilities, our building condition assessments, we build in a 2% inflation on those items there for our reserves and stuff. Um, and then we update those every year based on what our outcomes of our tenders and, and, and that have been. So um, we are up for our um, five years are up for our BCAs. So those, that tender, that RFP is just going out uh, shortly. And uh, so we'll update all these costings. We'll use all those again, go forward. But uh, we're trying to use the best, either what we've got for tenders or what we have in those BCAs and, and trying to project here as best we can, yes. Thanks, Kevin, appreciate it. And we do, we run up to that when we get to the budget every year as well, um, the, the overall. Okay, so this is moved by Councillor Burley, seconded by Councillor Mackey. Any further discussion? Anybody opposed? Okay, that is carried. I'm suggesting, Madam Clerk, maybe we take a little break. <laughs> uh, so I got uh, my phone 1135. Uh, can we be back at 1145? Madam Clerk, does that work? 10 minutes? Yep, I see net heads nodding, so I think that's appropriate. All right, so we'll take a quick break and we'll come back at 1145. Thank you. Make sure you put everybody on mic or mute there, please.
Heather, how are we making it? Are we getting everybody coming back? Let me just check on that. Couple, oh, that's there. A uh, couple more minutes. Like. Okay.
was like, Mr. Body's outside or was outside. <laughs> okay, thank you and uh, welcome back everyone. And uh, so carrying on our agenda, our next report is a financial update and year-end projections as of April 30th. And Kevin's bringing this forward and it's moved by Kev uh, Councillor Keveny and Councillor Millen. So Kevin, you can take over there. Thank you. Um, yeah, this report provides staff's first projection to year end based on uh, revenue expenditures to April 30th. Um, the report summarizes any variances that are being projected for the various departmental operations and reflects the potential financial impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, included with the, the written report is a, a high level variance analysis and, and a set of the county's financial statements uh, by departmental. So if I would like to just go through some highlights of each of the departments and walk through if, if, that's, if that's okay, Warden. So Sure. So why don't we just go right through and then if there's a, all of a sudden if somebody wishes to raise a question, they can either do that or wait to the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So under administration, uh, we're looking at a positive variance of about $252,000. Um, this is being a, a comp, or occurring due to staffing vacancies, uh, staffing changes, uh, reduction in staffing, uh, like not hiring students. Uh, we reduce our training courses and travel lines, and, and, and that's what's helping with the $252,000 surplus. Our investment income is projected to be about $200,000 lower than what we had budgeted. Uh, this is a result in the, the Bank of Canada's reduction in interest rates that occurred in March where the rates dropped uh, one and a half percent. So it's difficulty getting any, any, di um, any returns at all really on, on investments right now. So we, I, our investment policy does, uh, the way it was structured was that any net revenue budgeted greater than 1% of our levy would be placed in reserve for one-time uh, non-recurring expenditures and uh, therefore with that amount the interest the revenue dropping that amount to reserves will will correspond to that and, and therefore won't have a a budget impact uh, on us but uh, it, it just may impact on future reserves and, and the amount of money for one-time capital items or something that may come forward Council, the council budget is anticipated in the year with a surplus of about $58,000 with savings and salaries and benefits, travel, meal and accommodations as a result of COVID-19, requiring virtual meetings and fewer community, community, committee meetings occurring. Information services, uh, this budget is in, and this really is a budget that operates our uh, county and, and technology uh, network. Um, this uh, budget is anticipated at the end of the year with a surplus of about $24,000. Savings in computer software expenditures, desktop computer, reduced staff training and development costs um, being the main contributors to that surplus. Weekly indemnity and our workers' compensation. Uh, our weekly indemnity costs are anticipated at the end of the year with a shortfall of about $66,000. The number and the, the length of those weekly indemnity claims remain if they remain at that current level, that's the, what we project that deficit will be. Our workers' compensation budget is projecting a year-end deficit of about 192,000. Biggest cost driver here are the claims uh, where the employees have been unable to uh, return to work for a significant period of time. COVID-19 is also impacting this as employees, their ability to receive treatment from physiotherapists, chiropractors, et cetera, has been difficult during COVID. Um, if our year-end projections are right um, and the deficit is re realized for these two programs that we do have set up uh, uh, reserve funds for weekly indemnity and for our workers' compensation that could be called upon. And just for council's information, the WSAB reserve at the end of uh, 2019 had a balance just over $3 million. So our assessment budget, that's the amount that's paid to impact. Uh, that's projected in the year-end budget. Um, provincial offenses. We're projecting a deficit of 33,000 after cost sharing with Bruce County. Uh, gross revenues are about 245,000 lower than budgeted at the end of April, um, with, with our share of that being 100, about 144,000. 
Uh, ticket volumes and revenues are difficult to predict based on the first four months of the year. Uh, the decrease in the tickets that were written during this pandemic and, and the uncertainty of when the court is going to reopen and when tickets will actually get paid is making it difficult to project this budget. Um, the decline in revenue has been offset in, in, in reduced expenditures. We've had staff uh, redeployed. Uh, the court is not operating and we've had other savings as well. Um, it's difficult to, to, to project on this one uh, just with the uncertainty of the ticket volume. So, so if our revenue estimates are not what we think, then this deficit could be larger than what we're projecting. Um, we are starting to seem to see more uh, payments coming, so that's a positive sign. And, and just personally seeing more police and, and things happening on the roads lately, it appears like there's, we're starting to get into that mode of writing more tickets and stuff. So. <clears throat> health unit and other funding initiatives, um, we project the year on budget. The health unit's expenditures related to COVID-19 have been projected to be about 250000 for 2020. <clears throat> the provincial government has announced that the expenditures related to COVID-19, these emergency expenses will be funded by the province if they exceed the health unit's 2020 total budget. So we should be on, on uh, target there. Uh, property is uh, projecting in the year with surplus about five thousand dollars through just savings and salaries and benefits. Um, we didn't fill the student position, and uh, well, some of those savings they've been offset with higher cleaning costs here at the administration building for COVID nineteen. Uh, taxation supplementary taxation write offs. I, I have not prepared a year in position on that yet. I, it's too early in the year. I'll, I'll reach out later to the local municipalities and and uh, to see. Um, if I can get a projection on what that's going to look like for 2020. Planning, uh, they anticipate the end of the year with a surplus about $24,000. Again, it's savings and staff being redeployed. They've also had uh, staff on leave as a result of the pandemic. Uh, their application revenue received to date is close to a year-to-date budget and staff anticipate that other applications will be coming and prior to year end, so they figure that uh, their revenue projections are on, on budget. Um, Agriculture is it's projected to end the year on budget. Forestry and our forestry trails are, are currently on track and should be on budget. And trails is a uh, budget is anticipated the end of year on budget. Uh, economic development and tourism um, they're anticipating the end of the year on budget as a result of the the pandemic. Economic development and tour budgets are being combined to best serve our stakeholders through a refocus of projects and initiatives to support the economic recovery. The uh, Sydenham campus uh, as part of the economic development budget portfolio is going to end the year with a, um, or is projected to end the year with a $76,000 deficit. Uh, the number of fixed costs we have there and the inability to rent that uh, facility with it being closed is, is impacting that. But uh, the deficit is being absorbed in the economic development and tourism operating budgets. And uh, so overall, the, uh, the, the portfolio remains on budget and that's how they're working towards that. Ray Roots, uh, we're anticipating in the year with a surplus of about 155,000. Um, revenues are down considerably with the closure and then and the anticipated limited reopening as a result of COVID. Um, budget savings due to redeployment, uh, the decision to forgo all the hiring of the students and uh, the postponement of the traveling exhibit of, of help reduce costs and, uh, and are contributing to that surplus. And uh, the Bray Roots projecting a capital shortfall of about $10,000 on the capital side with unexpected additional roof repairs and the change order required. So, but staff will continue to look for capital savings to offset that shortfall as, as other projects move forward. Ontario Works is projected to end the year with a surplus of about 160,000. Um, mainly with that is the, on the Ontario Works administration and employment support budgets, uh, where uh, they've got about 146,000 in gross salary savings with, with staff vacancies and uh, fewer um, part time van driver hours. They've had a number of retirees that or others that have resigned in the department and those aren't being replaced this year to the pandemic. Per, uh, child care uh, projected to the end of year on budget. Uh, ministry stated that the funding recon reconciliation for the closure and the reopening periods and any subsequent funding adjustments will not place undue hardship on municipal budgets. 
housing, uh, staffing, vacancies, staffing changes that have occurred, reduction in staff training, conferences, travel, and uh, lower in anticipated heating repairs are, are, are providing $170,000 in operating budget surplus there. Long-term care, um, this portfolio is anticipated the end of the year with a deficit of about 1372000 um, Over the past two months, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the finances and the operations of the County of Gray's Long-Term Care Department. Uh, the financial impacts of COVID are difficult to predict at this time, given the uncertainty of provincial funding regarding the extraordinary expenditures and the unknown duration of this pandemic and the safeguards that will have, how long those will have to remain in place. Um, expenditures related to COVID-19 have been put into place as a result of provincial directives that have been received either from the Ministry of Long-Term Care, the Ministry of Health, Medical Officer of Health. This includes increased spending related to additional staff, personal protective equipment, supplies, equipment to support inf infection protection and control measures and screening and testing initiatives. Uh, Long-term care, care staff are continuing to work closely with finance and human resources and purchasing to ensure responsible emergency response spending. In the coming months, staff will consider actions that can be taken to help mitigate costs and, 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 and re reduce future deficits, reduce the projected future deficit. Transportation services um, project, projected year-end operating deficit of about 105,000 and about 817,000 in capital surplus. Um, the capital surplus is based on the capital projects um, planned to be tendered in 2020 and based on the awards to date, they, they're projecting a surplus of about 817,000. Um, staff is proposing to help fund corporate deficits related to COVID-19 providing these surplus funds and using additional unbudgeted federal gas tax funds to help fund capital projects in 2020. Um, what I mean by that is that we have um, projects there that we've got capital for that are funded from taxation and from and and or and or federal gas tax. We have submitted additional projects um, to under the federal gas tax um, portal with AMO, um, looking to use additional gas tax that we have in reserve as a as a means if if these deficits are realized by year end and there's no additional provincial or upper levels of government of funding that we have um, them listed with AMO and in that stream because you're before you start any work on these projects these projects are supposed to be listed on the AMO's portal before any expenditures take place. So if staff have done that as a placeholder that, and then if the council approves of that use that we need to use those revenue reserve funds to, to support these projects and create surplus taxation for our COVID-19 related over expenditures that, that can occur. So, so for this report presentation, the, the transportation services capital budget is, is projecting the, the year-end surplus, I said, about 818000 and that's based on the tender projects to date, and that's the taxation surplus, and, and that surplus is helping offset the COVID-19 deficit are being projected in other departments. Paramedic services, uh, services project the end of the year with a worst-case scenario of a $985,000 operating budget shortfall and a balanced capital budget. Um, we are still waiting on our uh, annual ministry funding announcement. We had included in the 2020 budget $67,000. And uh, as of this date, we still have no confirmation of what our funding increase will be. Uh, we have start. we did, as with all of our operations, we started tracking COVID costs back in, in March. And as of end of April, that uh, these costs totaled just over $214,000 for paramedic services has requested finance staff to do cost estimates on the impacts of COVID-19 uh, for paramedic services. Uh, we have submitted those uh, to them. Um, so we're hopeful that those inquiries are that additional provincial funding will be coming, um, be forthcoming for paramedic services. But at, at this time, we have no announcement of any of our annual funding nor any additional funding related to COVID. So. Based on this, sir, we are projecting a $985,000 shortfall for paramedic services. 
So overall, it's, uh, the, um, we're projecting here just a, a, a almost $1.1 million deficit uh, corporately, and uh, that is utilizing the uh, taxation surplus from capital and the transportation sur and transportation's capital surplus, along with all the other surpluses that have been identified from other departments in order to try to assist with these COVID-related deficits. So if, like I said, if council's approval is provided, uh, we can use additional federal gas tax funds in 2020 in order to offset this deficit. And uh, if, if, these, if the deficit numbers get worse, um, for example, it could get worse if we had a pandemic uh, or if we had an outbreak in one of our homes, which caused a lot more staffing and, and um, additional cleaning Etc. That uh, projections could even be higher. So we're we're assuming that we're going to stay outbreak free at this point. But uh, it is an opportunity or an, an avenue that we can fund these deficits if no provincial funding from or, or federal funding comes our way. So I, uh, that is my summary of my report and highlights. And uh, I'll try to answer questions, or I'll turn to those that have helped put this together or the other directors. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin. And as you said, this is as of April 30th. And uh, so are there questions out there from uh, county councillors with regards to this report? I have a question. Councillor Millen. Go ahead, Councillor Millen. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I suppose this question might better be directed to uh, CEO Wingrove. Kim, uh, in relation to Kevin's remarks about uh, at this point, at least, there's no indication of any further funding coming from provincial or federal coffers. Um, as administrator, are you aware? Well, I'm, I know there's lobbying going on, uh, but just what sort of is the flavor of that that lobbying? Are are there any prospects of getting any funding, or is it not likely to happen because? Uh, I'm pretty confident that this deficit is going to be real, if not bigger. <clears throat> yes. Okay, you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Through you, Mr. Warden. Um, as noted in the recommendation with this report, um, you know, that Gray County support the efforts of um, both FCM and AMO requesting further financial support. So both of those organizations, I think, are working hard on all of our behalf to try and get the message out to the province that, you know, we can't do this alone and we can't do it on the back of the property tax base at all. So um, we support it um, through our consent agenda, um, some correspondence earlier today. I think there's an opportunity for us potentially to look at, you know, lending our shoulder with a, with another letter or something like that. But at this point, that advocacy continues and I think we can only just get behind it. And as we probably heard yesterday that our credit rating for the federal government has been reduced uh, from AAA to AA plus or something like that. So we know that there are deficits, not only at this level, but certainly at the uh, federal and provincial levels as well. So hopefully uh, things move forward into the into a more safer safer uh, environment. Um, any further questions then, uh, or any follow up to that, Councillor Millen, if you wish? Any other questions out there? Um, if I may, if I may, just I, f I find it interesting that we're being surveyed for our costs, for example, through paramedic services. So that hopefully reassures me that they're, they're looking at something for paramedic services at least. Um, it has become quiet on the long-term care um, front. They did come out and give us funding April and May, but really haven't heard anything since then. So, um, but that, that's all I know at this point in time. Well, and I think from a comment I'll make as a warden is for our long-term care facilities, uh, we don't want to um, spare any expense to keep our, our uh, vulnerable, uh, safe. So uh, I think, you know, as moving forward, Kevin, I think we, we want to stay on track of what we're doing and, uh, and uh, move forward with what we have to do at the end of the year for sure. Any further comments or questions with regards to this report? Mm -hmm. So this, is, this has been put on the floor. Uh, anybody opposed? Hearing none, that is carried. Thank you. 
So now moving on to our resilience and recovery plan, and this is Savannah, and this has been moved by Councillor Patterson and Councillor Woodbury. So Savannah, would you wish to uh, bring forward? Thanks, Kevin. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you, Warden. And I do have Steve Furness with me, three offices that way, um, and he's going to be on to talk about uh, the recovery plan as well because he's been spearheading this uh, project for us. Uh, two council meetings ago, we had asked for your permission to go back and work with our finance department to look at our budgets and, and look at projects that we knew were not going to be moving forward and to take that uh, budget and refocus it to recovery planning uh, and recovery implementation for our municipalities and our businesses. Uh, so we did go back to our working group and we've spent uh, two meetings now with them kind of going line by line through this to find out what is it that they really truly need at the municipal level uh, and from our businesses so that we're complementing those local actions that you're already doing on the ground and to be able to fill the gaps where maybe at the local level you're unable to do that or as a county we can provide some consistency for our businesses. Uh, so that work has been ongoing. We do know through conversations with our business community from what we're hearing from our working group uh, that many businesses, because of the federal and provincial programs, have been able to find that liquidity. But what they're really struggling with now is how they return back to profit. And that we know is absolutely key. We do believe through those conversations that what our businesses really need are the facts so that they know uh, what they need to do and they have the right information from one source. They have the confidence to be able to reopen their doors, that they know they're taking good care of their employees, that they're taking good care of their community, and that the community is going to feel confident walking back through their doors. And also support uh, towards moving uh, back to profit. So a, less than a year ago, we were talking to you about uh, really trying to change that narrative saying that, you know, we need more people. And now today we're talking about saving jobs and saving businesses. So it's been a, a fundamental shift over the last year. Uh, and where we were a year ago too, we were just barely at a 2% unemployment rate and now we are 9.3% unemployment rate. So things have changed a great deal, which made a lot of the projects that we had planned for 2020 irrelevant uh, and now a great need from our business community to step up and help them take some action. So through the, the working group, we have developed a plan that we have before you today. It is a very high level plan and it keeps changing. Uh, right up until the report was ready to be published, it has changed numerous times because things are moving so quickly and we wanna make sure that we are flexible and we're adaptable uh, to be able to be proactive for our community. What is underlying the entire plan though is the need to enable our local entrepreneurs through those facts, that confidence and the support. Uh, the fundamentals of this plan really mean that we're turning our focus inwards to focus on our entrepreneurs and our residents. Uh, we're not looking outward. We're not looking to attract at this point. We are really focusing in to make sure that our businesses have the support that they need. And the goal ultimately is to be able to move towards sustainable economic development once again for our, for our entire region. So in the plan, uh, I'll share my screen if that works. Oh, whoops. I haven't done this on Zoom yet, we'll see. Share. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So through the plan, there are 27 action items in here, not including the additional data tracking that we think is really important to be able to provide that baseline and moving forward. And Steve's gonna talk about the plan specifically, but I do wanna mention a couple of the items that have been done to date, uh, because I really, I wanna call attention to just how amazing our working group has been, which means all of your staff, and all of our economic development and tourism staff um, working together to do this united. Uh, it's been very, very important and just thank you. You have amazing people, so I want you to know that. We did run the two all sector business surveys, which you've seen the results of in April and May. Uh, our business resource page, I think is on its third or fourth look, uh, but still updated almost daily. Uh, a business toolkit resource we have put together and that actually came uh, a recommendation from Town of Blue Mountains and from City of Owen Sound asking for some help and consistency for their businesses, especially downtown, uh, to be able to provide information that is necessary from public health, to be able to update their business hours as they go, uh, and be able to promote the alternative uh, methods that they are still using for delivery, whether it be curbside or online. So we did uh, pull that project together and all nine of our municipalities have the exact same signs. They're all co-branded. 
for the county and for your municipality and they're in downtown businesses and operators. Our community and business resiliency map continues to grow. It now includes patios, it includes PPE. Uh, as things change, it's a really good tool and platform to be able to amend as we need it. Um, providing access to PPE locally, we have that tracked, which is included on the resiliency map. And something that we definitely want to make note of is a small business transition program. And that is what was known as Starter Company Plus, run through our business enterprise center. It's a provincially funded program that is Starter Company Plus. You might remember last year, right around this time, actually, we did a presentation where we had about 20 business owners who came forward to be able to accept their grants and their training. Um, and what we do know now from the province is that they have allowed us to transition that program to be very COVID specific. So we were able to lessen the grants a little bit, tighten the program up, but still provide training that is necessary uh, in this time. So it's completely different than what it was, but we do have approval and it did uh, launch yesterday and is rolling out uh, beginning July 1st for applications. The Ask a Professional series was phenomenal. The last uh, one that was run was with Dr. Era and providing the information directly to businesses, making sure that they know what they need for PPE and public health requirements. And then last night was our Grey Bruce uh, business, or, uh, graduate celebration, which was just an awesome example of regional retention. And we're very excited to see what the museums will be able to do with that uh, to create that permanent collection so that we can have our youth come back and remember the time of 2020 and their, their graduation. So just before Steve discusses what, uh, what is in the plan and what those high level themes are, we did want to note that even though all of these actions are completely new because of COVID-19, the basis of what they are are no different than what we would normally do in economic development and tourism. It is all about providing industry and consumer support. Uh, it's just that the message and the focus is completely new. Uh, so that is what is different, but we did want to reinforce that we do budget to work with our stakeholders annually and to market and to support our businesses. So this still continues, it's just in a brand new light. And as Kevin mentioned in, uh, in the report just previous, we did work with finance to make sure that uh, the deficit that we were gonna expect from Sydenham because we cannot rent out the facility would be included within our overall and we would be able to account for it before we looked to refocus these budget dollars. So our, our departments combined will uh, look to, uh, to end the year on budget based on even this refocus, but keeping that deficit at bay. Uh, so that was really important to be able to come back to you today and say, we can do this with these funds and we do expect to end the year on budget. So I'm gonna hand it over to Steve then, and you tell me when I need to flip pages, Steve, and I will flip. And we can get the recovery <laughs> plan. <laughs> yes, well, let's keep flipping because I, I sense <laughs> to, to move on. So uh, we have, I think I wanna, if you go to outcomes, I think, you know, you can all read this report uh, at some point and, and it has a lot of detail existing, but I think the outcomes are what we really wanna communicate and all our actions are sort of guided by that. And we, we do move on a dime at some point. Uh, there was, um, for example, certain businesses were allowed to open the Friday and as of Thursday night, the regulations still hadn't been issued. So it's a matter of monitoring that very quickly and, and helping them get the word out. But outcomes, we want businesses to feel confident in their reopening and that involves their employees and their customers and, and themselves. And so we've heard that from a number of businesses without their employees, they don't have a business. So it's, um, it's very important that that combination happen, that they take advantage of e-commerce, uh, that they have mentorship and advice, um, that they understand what government programs are there. Uh, in the beginning, that was pretty challenging. There were so many programs and they were shifting. You basically had to watch the prime minister to understand what the programs were, how they were shifting. But most importantly, we want business owners to have op to be optimistic about the local economy. And it's, and it's more than just that, it's the community as well. So with those outcomes in mind, that's all our, the actions that we want to kind of work towards. Uh, Savannah talked a lot about what's ongoing. Uh, you know, in terms of the community, the facts, this was a lot of our focus early on. You know, what are the government financial programs? What's open? Uh, what are the protocols? So as our business is open, the resiliency map will become not, not as high a priority, but it's, it's still there. So we're working through uh, making sure the facts are there. 
talk about, you can flip, build confidence. You know, we talked about the, the reopening toolkit. We'll be going out with videos shortly. We've identified with your local EDOs and CEOs what, what businesses would be a good example to highlight. And there's success stories and how people have shifted their businesses. And it truly is remarkable how some businesses have shifted, not just their business and where people flow, but what products they're selling and, uh, and how they're selling it. The other thing will be a destination toolkit. It's more of a resource listing. Many of uh, our downtowns are, are moving in this direction quickly. So we wanted to pull together best practices on downtown patios, street closures, uh, that kind of thing. Um, the next page, Sam. So su supporting small business, and really this is where, uh, you know, the support and focus has to be. Uh, Savannah talked about um, starter company, but, you know, just to remind everyone that we do have our community improvement plans and there will be some businesses who want to do use those programs. I just remind you, if you don't have a community improvement plan, we can help you get one in place very, very quickly. We have some great templates, um, particularly at Gray Highlands. They've done one recently. Uh, we can use that as a template. Uh, I would say the other uh, shop here program, provincial, the province has come forward uh, with for going online. We can continue to see and support that, that effort. Um, also supported by the Starter Company Plus program, uh, a grant program that we've talked about, which is a third, the third bullet there. Um, I think the other one that um, is worth mentioning is the bottom sounding board uh, mentorship with the Catapult. The Catapult is our non-for-profit group that's supporting existing businesses Accelerate. They work very closely with our Enterprise Center and we're hoping to have some dollars there to, um, to help give local membership, uh, mentorship to, to businesses that may just really need to reinvent themselves. Next slide, Savannah. Marketing and communication. So this is where later on or starting now, we're gonna to start to, to push our buy local campaign. And one of our messages will be to really highlight all the trails and natural attractions, but then to link that to um, outdoor patios. And we really wanna make that link uh, and highlight. Uh, I hadn't quite done the numbers, but if every resident of, of, of Gray County went on the trail, they would have something like 100 meters of trail. So lots of space to, um, to, to find distancing space. So between the buy local and the trail promotion and the, and the patio promotion, we really want to support our, our downtowns and, um, and that restaurant sector. Uh, and then of course, there'll be more marketing with RTO7s and tourism once the tourism sector fully opens up. And of course, the last two sections, you know, what can municipal councils do you know, deferring tax penalties and things. I think you've already been working on that. Uh, and of course, tracking and measuring the economy uh, so that we can understand how, how fast or uh, we're coming out of this or to what degree we're coming out of it. So I won't, didn't go through every item, but I would open it up for, for questions uh, or suggestions or observations. Okay, Steve, thank you. Uh, County Council, um, any questions or comments to uh, Steve or Savannah? Any, any uh, comments there? All right, well, thanks uh, for the presenting that and, and it's good to see a bit of a plan out there that can help uh, those uh, businesses and, and lay out what we're going to be moving forward with. Um, so then this was moved by Councillor uh, Patterson and second by Councillor Woodbury. Um, is there anybody opposed to this resolution? Seeing none, uh, that is carried. Thanks uh, Savannah and thanks Steve for that. And if sure if anybody else has any questions furthering up from this, they can follow up with you. Thank you. All right. So now moving forward with our agenda, uh, our next one is the, with regards to the SWIFT report, and uh, Kim is, uh, is going to take, take this one on, and it's moved by Councillor Robinson and second by Councillor Hicks, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Kim, Madam hey. CEO. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Um, so Council will recall that uh, we last spoke about SWIFT on uh, May 14th when we looked at the report with regard to the loan guarantee, and just in case you missed it, 
uh, there was a press release out um, from MPP Walker uh, earlier this week that the, the RFP that covers the Gray County projects um, is on the street. It closes July 10th and they're looking at a $16 million investment in uh, new high-speed internet in Gray County. So we'll be looking forward to that. Um, this particular report is now looking more to the future. And there are two things. One is just an update on where Western Ontario Wardens Caucus is looking towards the, the future of, of um, support and advocacy for more high-speed inter internet. And um, also asking about um, whether County Council would lend their name to a couple of, of letters requesting additional funding from um, uh, federal entities. So uh, Western Ontario Wardens Caucus called a special meeting on June the 4th. Um, they wanted to talk about um, the potential of a SWIFT 2.0. Um, right now we're in the last phase of the original uh, SWIFT funding, so wanting to look at you know, where do you want to go with the future, and also talking about some of the projects or uh, funding streams that are available to us now. Um, the CRTC has a $750 million broadband fund and I said, which is the Industry Science and Economic Development, has a $1.7 billion universal broadband fund, both um, available at this time. The Warden's Caucus feels that funding from the province and the Government of Canada is urgently needed to address our region's large connectivity gaps that we've certainly um, underst understanding the impact of those as we try to cope with COVID and, and we're moving into a virtual world. Um, Western Ontario Wardens Caucus supports the funding of a SWIFT model as the mechanism to advance the expansion of broadband infrastructure across the region. We now know, having been through three phases of, of SWIFT projects, that the model works, it delivers results, and can be um, immediately leveraged to upgrade networks and coverage in our region's underserved areas. Um, when they talked about SWIFT 2.0, uh, caucus was presented with five options. One was to just, you know, let it lie and let people go out on their own and try and pursue projects as best they could. Um, options two, three, and four included municipalities pursuing individually, pursuing funding as a group, um, or actually doing more what's happened in Eastern Ontario where they actually designed the projects themselves and then RFP'd them. In the end, as I've said, um, they felt that using the SWIFT model was one that had a lot of merit. Um, SWIFT 2.0 would see Western Wardens pursuing funding and executing $500 million worth of projects. Um, the focus would be on fiber rather than wireless, and I thought that might be an interesting shift for, for some of you. Um, and, and really, being very clear about our target as being unserved areas to a maximum uh, density of about 15 premises per kilometer. And just by way of comparison, the average density of unserved premises in gray is 5.4. So certainly anything that we have would be well within that threshold. Um, the federal and provincial governments would be requested to provide 367 million with the municipalities responsible for 50 in project spend and 10 in project administration. So the SWIFT 2.0 model would see um, an increase in the subsidy that was available for ISPs. These are, um, as we move through this process, um, the, it becomes less and less desirable. The return on investment gets longer for the internet service providers. So um, providing them with additional subsidy was meant to make these projects more attractive. And um, beyond that uh, $500 million request for SWIFT 2.0 funding, Western Wardens would also request 44 million to complete the remaining unfunded SWIFT, the current SWIFT uh, group of projects that they are aware of. And this would include um, almost $6 million worth of work in Gray County. So that's the SWIFT piece, that's separate. We don't need to do anything at this time. Um, the advocacy work uh, that the Economic Development Group within Western Ontario Wardens Caucus is, is taking on would simply be working hard to pursue that funding should um, 
we be successful should the Wardens Caucus actually see money from the province for SWIFT 2.0, then we would have another conversation at this table. The CRTC and ISET uh, program requests um, right now, um, we feel it's important that Southwestern Ontario, which is 10% of, uh, of the population of Canada, should reasonably expect to receive something similar as far as a share of the program funding. Western Wardens must advocate for the region's fair share and um, applications are opening this year for, for that money and um, they are asking that we provide the letters that are attached to this report from Gray County to both CRTC and to ISED. So that's it in a nutshell and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks, uh, Madam CEO. And do you, would you want a separate resolution for that letter, or just that you just feel that if this report supported, then that would be automatic, Madam Yeah, CEO? the recommendation to receive this yeah. report, and then and then it follows that uh, we submit the letters for CRTC and I sent. So it is part of the resolution, and if passed, then we'll staff will work to make sure they. Okay, so it, it is uh, it is moved by uh, Councilor Robinson and Councilor Hicks. Is there any questions? to this report. Uh, okay, I got Councillor Potter. I see him on the screen. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Um, yes, what kind of commitment do we have? We're, we're, once again, we're being asked to put money into this program that so far has underperformed and now we're being asked for more uh, without any commitment as to what they might do. Uh, without any commitment as to transparency in, in terms of reporting to us and to the people who pay the taxes in Gray County. And uh, we don't have any commitment that we, as a council, will have any say in what they're doing. What we're going to do in Blue Mountains, we have a, a motion coming forward on Monday to form a task force uh, to look into this ourselves. Uh, to see where we stand and, and what is possible uh, because this is just way too important to let another 10 years go by with nothing being done. Um, so at least, at least we have this commitment that they're going to put some money our way, uh, but we are going to be putting money their way. And, and on that basis, I would like to know more about what kind of say we will have, what kind of say our rate payers will have, uh, and uh, what uh, reporting we will get in return. So I have a lot more, but I realize that we're, uh, we, we have a lot on the go and there are probably lots of other speakers. So I'll leave it at that for now, but thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Potter. Madam CEO, do you have any comments to that? Well, a, a couple, I think. First of all, uh, Gray County has put in slightly more than $1 million into, into the SWIFT program and will receive under the RFPs that, that are out right now in excess of $15 million. So we are seeing some significant investment in infrastructure based on the investment that we've, that we've made. Um, with regard to um, the, the future and, and SWIFT 2.0, I think the discussion around the table with regard to looking at fiber and, and wanting to um, direct more of our influence into securing uh, fiber investments is something um, that might be a positive step for um, future is fiber is foundational and, and I think facilitates further investment in wireless and, and other um, types of um, high speed internet. Um, we think we are having to be careful about not running afoul of the bonusing rules. We, we must run a competitive process when we're, we're working with, um, with tax money. And um, I, I think that um, SWIFT and, and the province and the federal government remain very committed to that. So, you know, as much as we can make projects attractive and we can make sure that we've done all of the homework that we can so that people understand where the projects are and where the opportunities are, at the end of the day, it needs to be competitive and the internet service providers 
um, will step up where, where they feel that there's a business opportunity to do so. Okay. Mr. Wharton, uh, I do have a list of um, yep. speakers. Uh, okay. Councillor Hicks. Yes. Counsel Councillor Robinson. Yes. And Councillor Soever. Okay, I will go through the list. Okay, thank you for that, Madam Clerk. So going down the list, uh, Deputy Mayor Warden, um, uh, Salwin Hicks, uh, you have the floor. Councillor Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> just responding to Councillor Potter, I'm, I'm a little surprised by your comments because I would have thought that the exciting announcement this week would have put a smile on your face. I mean, we are seeing uh, potentially uh, a 15 time uh, multiplier of our investment and, and those projects are now up uh, with a request for proposal. Uh, this is really, really good news for the people in Gray County. Um, I want to say that uh, in, in my view, uh, the SWIFT uh, 2.0 um, option was the best option. You'll notice that in that range of options, there was an option for going it alone. Um, I dare say, I, I don't think uh, you'll be able to get the kind of success uh, that SWIFT is producing going it alone. Uh, but, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong there. Um, SWIFT, you have to remember, is a creature of the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. Uh, and so you'll notice that the proposals will, might come from SWIFT, but any uh, activity with respect to uh, a request for funding or pushing uh, for funding has to come from the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. In my view, the, the target, the new target for um, SWIFT 2.0, focusing on medium density uh, outcomes makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, given that the average uh, mm -hmm. density of our on service roads is just 5.4 homes per kilometer in Gray County, I think that it makes a lot of sense to uh, target on the medium density uh, outcomes. So in other words, um, you, we're gonna increase the subsidies uh, uh, for the internet service providers from 67% to 83% because we need to make that more attractive for them. And at the same time, we'll be giving greater <clears throat> points to those proposals um, that uh, focus on kilometers uh, of fiber run rather than focusing on the homes that you might, uh, might be passing. I think that makes a lot of sense. The, uh, the request for $44 million to uh, address so, so, some residual projects from SWIFT 2.1 also makes a lot of sense because these are projects that have come forward. They, if we had the money, we would have funded them. Uh, they're ready to go. Uh, everything's in place. If we have that $44 million, uh, we'd be able to get going right away because we wouldn't need to go back and ask for further uh, requests for proposals. They're in place already. Uh, the big issue that I really wanted, I think needs uh, a lot of attention from us, is that proposal uh, that the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, approved, which talked about letting municipalities decide if they want to allow uh, wireless proposals in their region. Um, I have to tell you, uh, that issue will really depend on what the province allows us to do. Uh, right now, the, the province mandates uh, that we focus on um, areas uh, where someone doesn't have a claim that, that they're able to meet that minimum requirement, the 50 uh, down and 10, uh, 10 up. So in my view, uh, in terms of local advocacy, I would suggest that we be approaching um, uh, AMO, at AMO, approaching a delegation with respect to that issue, um, that we be able to, as municipalities, uh, make a local decision about whether we favor um, uh, fiber or sorry, wireless projects uh, or not. Um, currently, uh, um, if we look at uh, Gray County, if you draw a line down uh, north to south, the separating west and east of Gray County, about half of Gray County will be exempted, meaning SWIFT cannot uh, put a project in the eastern half uh, of Gray County because there have been successful claims by wireless um, uh, entities uh, that they can meet that minimum requirement. Uh, so uh, in my view, that's a debate that we're gonna have to have as a county. And uh, uh, that's why I say I, I would be pushing very hard for the province to allow local municipalities 
to make a decision about whether or not um, they favor wireless over uh, fiber. Uh, in, in my personal uh, view, fiber is the best. Um, nothing is greater than the speed of light. Uh, and that's what fiber is. You don't get anything faster than that. Uh, fiber is robust. It's dependable and it's affordable. That's the other factor that we have to keep in mind. It's one thing to say, yes, we've got this service, but can I afford it? And is it dependable or is it going to fall down all the time? Um, I guess on that point, I would ask you to consider the difference between a land, uh, if you have a phone, consider the difference between your landline and a cell phone. Uh, that's really the difference there. Uh, so those are the comments that I wanted to make and I'll be supporting the recommendation. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Deputy Warden, Councillor Hicks. And uh, next, I'll go on to Councillor Robinson. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you, I, I'm appreciating all of the discussion that we're having on, broad, on broadband. It, um, certainly at Gray County, we've elevated that discussion level. Um, I'm pleased with the, the good news announcements from, from the province, and I'm equally pleased that uh, broadband has been elevated on our uh, Gray County agendas in, in terms of uh, reports and discussions. Um, uh, by Gray County Council. I would very much, uh, uh, well, I am the seconder, so I'm happy with the recommendation, but I would very much appreciate on behalf of Gray County Council and our Gray County uh, residents and uh, business owners, if we could have, um, whether it's through the Western Warden Caucus or SWIFT, come again to um, our Gray County Council and do a delegation in terms of providing, um, you know, status report, uh, an update, fiber versus any other options, um, you know, just a, uh, maybe a diagnostic of um, uh, broadband in relation to Gray County um, terrain. So I'm looking for more of a more, more discussion at our virtual horseshoe, but also have that discussion fanned out to our Gray County residents. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Robinson. And you're actually the mover of this resolution and Councillor Hicks is the seconder. So there you go. Thank you. Um, Councillor Soever, you were next. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, so I have a lot of questions. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, in the, the staff report, there's a couple of things. Um, it says it's certain in the minutes, and I'm comparing the staff report to the minutes of the, the, the Western Warden's Caucus, and there, they, there is um, an upper, it says upper limit on premises pass per kilometer of fiber. And then it says allow municipal input to target more or less dense areas. And in the staff report, it has a number of 15 premises per kilometer. Has there been a decision actually made on what that density is, the upper limit that's eligible for projects? Or is uh, it still an open question? Maybe I'll go to the CAO first, Madam CAO. Well, in, the, in the slides, they talked about, if you, if you look at the slides, and they talked about yes. um, making a decision about targeting medium density, mm -hmm. and that that medium density is going to topped out at 15.4 premises per kilometer is my understanding. Um, further to uh, the points that um, Councillor Hicks made, however, all of this is contingent on us receiving funding for a program and uh, whatever um, a program guidelines that that funder sees fit to impose on, on us. So um, we're advocating for what we feel would be um, most viable and most useful for for our communities. Yes. Okay. So the the fifteen isn't a firm number yet, then, but it's a discussion. Nothing will be firm unless we actually receive. Yeah, and we receive a confirmed funding. Okay. Um, and then, so now we're going to the. Uh, the, um, we're, we're bumping the subsidy from 83 from the current 67 to the providers. Um, and um, so does that mean the current programs aren't working? No, I think though, as, as projects roll out, um, certainly 
you know, the companies, if, if I can speak on behalf of the internet service providers, I think our experience with business suggests that you're going to take the projects that are going to give you the best return on your investment the most quickly. And so as those projects are undertaken and completed, then, you know, people will move down the list. So they become, projects become certainly less attractive from a financial perspective from the companies or the terrain is more difficult or the population is less dense. So you're incentivizing the behavior that you want to see, which is please come and make internet available to those places that are even more rural than the initial ones that were serviced. So the great county projects. So um, SWIFT 2.2, there it says there's 4.2 million for 549 kilometers of fiber, but the SWIFT presentation, um, it shows that there's actually 2,734 uh, kilometers of unserviced roads. So that would mean that even with SWIFT 2.0, we're only going to service 20% of the unserviced road? It's a huge, huge need out there. And I think this has been well covered in the media, just to the extent to which Ontario is a huge pro province and southwestern Ontario is a huge geography. So, um, you know, it's going to take a number of years to be able to, to get um, these gaps filled in. And then it says that there's a request for another 44 million for the unfunded SWIFT 1.0 projects. But I see the government did, the federal government and, and both the province have already allocated $63.7 million each for those projects. So is this 44 million on top of the the money that was in the provincial funding announcement of January 20th. That's my understanding, yes. So, and, and this, this has my concern, and I'm all for high, rural high-speed internet, and this is where, but if you look at the SWIFT financials, they were fully financed in 2016, and since then they've spent um, quite a bit of money, uh, They've collected 14 million from the partners and 2 million from, no, it's 11.9 from the partners, so almost 12 from the partners and 2 million in government grants. But to the end of 2018, their 2019 financial statements aren't yet available. But um, so they've collected uh, 14 million and they've spent seven, but nothing was spent on projects, even though in 2018, in their financial statements, they, they had budgeted 18, $80 million worth of projects and delivered exactly nothing and spent nothing on these projects with a delay. So I think that some of the problems questions might be better put to Barry Field. He certainly, he did commit to us that um, once the embargo on communications had been lifted and he'd be in a position to speak to projects that he would be willing to come back and speak to this council further to Councillor Robinson's point. Um, I think there are a number of, of reasons why, um, both at the provincial and federal level, why things move or why they don't, but it, re it really would be uh, Mr. Field's purview to speak to those. I I'm not in a position, I'm afraid. Yeah, and I think that, that uh, that's really what I'm getting around to asking for, because when you analyze SWIFT going back to 2016, if they were a private corporation right now, nobody would fund them. Not only haven't they met their targets and delivered on time and within budget, but they also have a 23 person board with one person that has demonstrable communication, telecommunications experience. So when you look at that, if, if they were a private corporation going to raise money from the public, um, people would say, well, you got a 23 person board. You have one person that has actually has extensive experience on your board in the business you're in. Um, you're not gonna get funded. And I think 
you know, as stewards of the public purse, we need to get answers to these questions. Then, you know, I think it's, I, I'm all for internet. And I think if people were subsidized to 83%, you'd have people lining up at your door with projects. And, you know, my question is, yeah, fiber is the best. It's the platinum standard. It'd be great if everybody could get fiber, but we're looking at even 2.0 covering only 20% for $4.2 million of our, of our portion, never mind the federal government and the province. Um, you know, we have to look and say, can you deliver 50, 10 or better? I've been approached by a major internet provider that says they can do probably twice 50, 10 with uh, 5G technology, as long as their towers are connected by fiber. So I, I think it behooves us to see if we can, uh, you know, ask these questions of SWIFT and say, you know, what guarantees are there that the performance is going to be improved over what it has been since 2016? And so, Councillor Soever, that you bring some good points. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Councillor Hicks, are you able to be warden? Are you able to add some? I know you sit on the board. And maybe you've had more of these conversations uh, there. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, uh, Councillor Soever and Councillor Potter and everyone else will, will be able to have all of their questions answered now that the embargo on communication is, is uh, over uh, and we can speak. Uh, you will have those questions answered. We will invite Mr. Field to come and uh, make a presentation and make himself available. I think what I'm focusing on is the bottom line. For the people, I'm confident in saying to the people of Gray County that you're getting a 15 times multiplier on your investment. That's the bottom line. You know, I, talking about the the uh, fiber, and when you lay fiber, if you if you lay one kilometer of fiber and it crosses, it passes a thousand homes, you're not going to incentivize. Uh, the internet service provider uh, that much. They're not going to need an incentive uh, in order to lay that fiber. But if you're laying a kilometer uh, of fiber and it's passing five homes, uh, that's really what SWIFT is all about. We're trying to get internet out to those people who ordinarily would not be uh, a target for the internet service providers without some sort of incentive. That's what SWIFT is, uh, is very much trying to do. So, uh, you know, look, we will continue. We've had very good discussion. Uh, I, I can count now, I think, at least three meetings at which we've had discussion on broadband. Uh, it's an important uh, topic. We'll continue to have those discussions. And I'm happy that now that the embargo is gone, Mr. Field will be able to come and uh, you'll be able to have all of your questions answered. By the way, he did make a presentation to this very council not that long ago. Right. Um, Warden, so, I have uh, Councillor Body as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Body. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. It's um, hearing a fifteen million re return on a one million investment is uh, something that we should be. Of course, we, we've got to complete it, but we, that's something we should be pumping out. So that's pretty easy for people to understand, and it's not something necessarily that I understood, uh, perhaps as a councillor uh, prior to this moment. I, I think we got to think of ourselves as being pioneers. You know, uh, somebody built a log cabin a hundred years ago and then they put in running water and it was like quite a while before they got the toilet. And the hot shower was long after that. We're, we're spending a lot of money and we're, uh, we're building something that our successors in council long after we're around are going to keep building on. And uh, we're not gonna see the hot water shower, uh, you know, immediately. Um, you know, to say that a private corporation uh, wouldn't get funding, uh, et cetera, it, you know, that might be fair, but a private corporation wouldn't be looking at putting fiber here. It's not a good return on the investment. They wouldn't be interested. We're relying on private corporations and how they operate. Uh, Bell Telephone and Rogers wouldn't be interested. They want to amortize their fiber in a much shorter period of time. So, you know, this is what we've got. Luckily, we've got government people that are uh, the, the great wardens, uh, sorry, the Western Wardens uh, Caucus that are working uh, on this and have been working on this for a number of years. And little by little by little, we're, uh, we're getting someplace that we wouldn't have got uh, otherwise. Um, on 
towers versus fiber, I know here we had a proposal to put in a uh, tower and it was about as popular as a wind turbine. People didn't want it in their neighborhood. It's something we'll have to think about as we move forward, but they're not as popular as uh, what's running under the ground and we don't see it. And uh, fiber, I think, is a better building block going forward. But again, we're building. We're, we're, we're just starting off. We're just building. We've got a long way to go. I look forward to hearing some of the answers from the experts, but I'm... Um, I, I, I think we're, uh, we're perhaps, uh, including me, we're perhaps have been and are being impatient, expecting something that uh, we, sh we shouldn't expect. But those are my thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Boddy. And uh, before I make the last two comments, uh, Madam Clerk, is there anybody else wishes to speak? No, sir. Okay, so we do have this on here and it's been suggested that now that the communication gag is over, we can invite uh, Mr. Fields to come to our council. We've had great conversation, which is fantastic because we we certainly realize that internet, certainly because of COVID-19 has become uh, a real high point in the sense of necessity. And, and uh, I've made comments from people different press and uh, asked me is we're gonna continue to want more and more internet and, and higher speed internet because of the of the society and and where we're heading uh so i guess the only question i have and, and maybe this is to counselor uh, hicks the deputy warden is um and, and it's about providing the minimum standard to across the county is at some time maybe when barry comes is if there's certain uh areas of our, our county that are that are opting out because of that uh, um 10 up and or, or sorry 50 up and 10 10 down i think you said uh, is there an area like a map that will be provided to show where those areas that money will be funded because of that of, of that areas of not being provided to, to you, Councillor Hicks? And that's something maybe to take back to the board and it, it maybe not able to provide it in the near future. But is that something that we will could be able to see? Yes. Yeah, so you can see that right now on the SWIFT uh, website, the maps are available. Okay. Uh, and and they are updated as the uh, proposals come in and as we see where the project uh, will actually uh, be. I can tell you right now uh, that one of my concerns is that SWIFT is really only focused on the western half of Gray County. Okay. Because of that 50, that, that mandate around that the province has put in to say, if somebody claims and successfully claims to be able to provide uh, a download of 50 and an upload of 10, uh, if they can meet that requirement, regardless of how affordable or you know how reliable, I suppose uh, to an extent it might be, uh, we have to stay away from those areas. Right. Okay. And there's nothing stopping that companies out there can expand to have fiber and and having a customer base that they can expand beyond that if they feel that there's a, a market for it. I, I presume. That's exactly the the hope is that once that uh, infrastructure is expanded. Uh, keep in mind that, uh, you know, 5G and all of these other technologies, uh, they're still reliant on fiber in the ground. Uh, so the more we expand that sort of uh, uh, skeleton uh, of the system, uh, the better off we'll be with uh, being able to provide other types of options as well. By the way, there was a figure, and I don't remember it, uh, Kim might remember this figure, uh, in the uh, presentation made to the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus, about how many billion uh, dollars it would take uh, to fiberize uh, all of the uh, underservice uh, roads right now in southwestern Ontario. It's a huge, huge uh, uh, figure. This is, again, not the silver bullet, but it certainly is a very good uh, project to have happening. This is great news for Gray County. Okay, thank you very much for that, Deputy Warden, uh, Councillor Hicks. And Kim, do you have any last comments before other there is in this in the slide deck um, there is a slide titled how much money do we need and the remaining need um, should we be successful with uh, with all of this advocacy work would still be 1.7 billion dollars now that's a straight up fiber numbers so i would anticipate it would be something less than that because there are places where fiber simply doesn't work but to councillor hicks's point it's a huge huge need right and I think there was a change, I think either late 2018, early 2019 with the structure of SWIFT that there were some changes made. And I think that was around the time when uh, uh, Councillor Hicks was appointed to that board to be, I think, a little bit more accountable there as well, uh, if I recall. Um, okay, so uh, well, uh, so for Mr. The, Warden? Yes. 
I'm sorry, I have um, Councillor Millen and I have Councillor Soever with a follow up. Okay, sorry, Councillor Millen and Councillor Soever. Just, just a comment, Mr. Warden, um, uh, regarding the return on the investment. Don't forget that there are local companies that are bidding on these RFPs as well. So there's a multiplier effect if they get these projects uh, and they're very dedicated to the community. And uh, I dare say that if they get uh, one of these projects or more, um, you know, there's, there's ways they can multiply the effect of those monies uh, locally. So I think it's very important that we, uh, we concentrate on the return on the investment. And uh, as uh, Councillor Hicks has pointed out, this is a tremendous opportunity for Gray County. Thanks for that, Councillor Millen and, uh, and uh, Councillor Soever. Yes, uh, just um, Blue Mountains is in the eastern part of uh, Gray County and, and a large part of our, our area does uh, qualify for uh, performance. I think it's Gray Highlands is the <coughs> one that's in the large excluded block, um, if I remember the map correctly. So there is a large part of rural town of Blue Mountains. I just wanted to make that clear that that will qualify even though we're in the eastern part. We're not entirely excluded. Right, yeah, and, that, and that's based on the local providers that have been expanding, I'll, I'll sort of say that here in Gray Highlands as well, for sure. Any further comments out there? Um, I mean, certainly for those particular comments, if we get Barry Fields back here at a certain time and, and he can sort of address those parts with regards to the financial and the boards and, and the accountability on that sense, for sure. So, so this was moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Hicks, Deputy Warden. Any further comments? Any opposed to this report? Hearing none, that is carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, good discussion. Uh, I mean, I think from the general public is they're very uh, interested in, in broadband and uh, I think the provincial and federal governments are very much attainable to, to that uh, what's being heard out there. So this was an addition, this, moving on to the next one, PDR CW 3020 Home Farm Subdivision update, update. This was a, a late addition, and, and uh, I have this um, moved by uh, Councillor Keaveny and second by Councillor Millen. And I think, Scott, are you on the line there to take uh, on this report? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Warden and members of council. And I, I will try to be brief with this because I recognize that the report itself was, was not overly brief for sure. So I'm just going to try to bring up a map here. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so what we have before us is a um, plan of subdivision and, and the subject lands are shown in blue there. And I will note uh, some neighboring developments, Eden Oak to, to sort of the Northeast and Park Ridge to the North, as well as some town owned lands uh, shown in, in red there as well. The proposed development would look at uh, 215 new residential units in addition to some park space, uh, some open space areas. Oh and other per, uh, protected lands. Sorry, can you see the, uh, the map on the screen? Uh, for my, it's, it's going in circles. We need better broadband. <laughs> I will try to reshare, sorry about that. Maybe it's one of those switches. Is it showing up there now? Yes, this okay. is my screen. This. Does everybody else have it? Yes. yes. Okay, go ahead, so, Scott. Sorry about that, don't blame the switches, blame the user in this case, so. Um, so yeah, this is a, a development for 215 units. It's uh, comprised of mostly townhomes with some singles. Um, the, the subject lands are about 55 hectares in size in terms of what's shown in blue there on your screen. And I would note that uh, this development was originally submitted in, in 2015 and it was submitted via a plan of subdivision application as well as a zoning amendment application and an official plan application, official plan amendment application to the town. The initial applications were proposing development on lands shown in blue, as well as development on the lands shown in red there owned by the town. At that time, there was a memor memorandum of understanding in place between the town and the developer uh, to look at a land exchange, which would have the developer developing those town owned lands. Um, as such, at that time, they were looking at uh, 277 units rather than the 215 being proposed now. Uh, that memorandum of understanding is no longer in place. As such, we're dealing with a, a subdivision that's, that's just looking at the lands in blue there. 
I would note that all three of these applications uh, were appealed to, at that time, what was called the Ontario Municipal Board, just before it trans transitioned to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, um, based on non-decisions by both the, the county and the town, respectively. Um, in the report, it notes that there was a, a two-week hearing scheduled for this, um, this uh, matter starting on July 20th. As of uh, Tuesday of this week, that hearing has now been cancelled uh, by the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, although we are hopeful that, uh, uh, subject to Council's review today, that we'll be able to request a, a settlement hearing, and that can likely be done virtually or via teleconference. The new residential development and the park space will... will um, have access off of a series of internal roads uh, coming off of uh, Grey Road 19, both off of Helen Street and off of a, a new road that will be coming off adjacent to Birch's Boulevard, uh, just to the west there. Um, I would note that the lands uh, are varied in topography because we have the, the Nipissing Ridge crossing these lands and, and the lands that are being developed today or proposed to be developed are, are sort of the uplands, if you will, in, in the western portion of the property. Uh, there are, are some further lowlands that would be developed potentially in the future, um, sort of adjacent to the Eden Oak development and off of uh, Birchview Trail just to the south there. Um, the other important feature on the site, and which is, which is quite interesting, is, is a um, former First Nations uh, village site. And, and this site uh, actually dates back uh, hundreds of years. It's, it's been called the Plater Martin site. Uh, and so that was a significant consideration in terms of looking at, uh, at the development of this site. So that uh, Plater Martin site will not be developed as part of this development. Uh, and there are some proposed draft plan conditions that speak to uh, further engagement with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, uh, as well as having the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation on site as the lands are being cleared, uh, just to make sure um, there's no further evidence of, of burials or any other artifacts outside of the, uh, the mapped Plater Martin site. Um, this uh, application has been circulated to agencies who are generally supportive of the uh, development now with the, the uh, recommended draft plan conditions attached to this report. There was public consultation, of course, as part of uh, this process, and we did get some public uh, comments and, and concerns with respect to this development. And they really fell into the categories of, of uh, traffic impacts, impacts on the environment, whether or not the, uh, the uh, development was consistent with both uh, town and county planning documents. Uh, there were some comments about the former memorandum of understanding, and there were some comments about the uh, proposed development in proximity to some of the existing homes off of Gray Road 19. Uh, with respect to the traffic, they did do a traffic impact study for this development, and that was when it was still proposed at 277 units. Uh, both town staff and county transportation staff are now satisfied that, uh, that this development can be accommodated into the, the road network um, and have no further traffic concerns in that regard. With respect to the, the impacts on the environment, both the county and the town jointly hired a peer reviewer um, to review all of the environmental aspects of this development. Uh, there was a, a large series of back and forths between our peer reviewer and, and the developer's environmental consultant and subject to some addendums and, uh, and some draft plan conditions being issued, uh, the county and town peer reviewer is, um, is supportive of the development. And I would note that uh, both the Niagara Scarpment Commission and the Gray Sobel Conservation Authority uh, were also uh, reviewing the environmental aspects of this development as well. With respect to uh, planning conformity, that's generally covered in the staff report, and I'll just touch on the very highlights here today. Um, with respect to the mem memorandum of understanding, uh, this is not a, do uh, a document that's uh, being considered by either council here today or by the tribunal. Uh, the memorandum of understanding is no longer in place, so there's no further need to address those comments. Uh, and with respect to the proximity to the existing homes, um, this comment was raised by a landowner who, who uh, owns two homes along the county road, uh, which immediately abut the town-owned lands, which are shown in red on the screen. Um, now that the town-owned lands are no longer being part of this development, uh, that's become less of a concern. And I will note with this particular landowner, uh, there's also been a lot addition to the rear of their two properties. Um, as such, there's further buffer space available there as well. One of the other things I would note with respect to this development is 
Um, it was originally submitted in, in 2015, and since 2015, we've had changes to the Planning Act, we've had a new provincial policy statement, we've had a new Niagara Escarpment plan, new county official plan, a new town official plan, and a new town zoning bylaw. Um, I would note that in the staff review at both the county and town level, um, we've been looking at uh, the most recent versions of each of those documents because they represent our respective councils' um, reflection of the public interest in its most current form. Um, I would also note that based on the changes to the town official plan that happened in their 2016 official plan, as well as the removal of the town owned lands from this proposed development, a town official plan amendment is, is no longer required. Um, staff have been working, staff at the county have been working with staff at the town as well as the proponent on a potential settlement uh, for this matter. And that would involve a settlement on, on the draft plan of subdivision as well as, as the zoning amendment. Both the proponent and town staff have been excellent to work with. And we think subject to, to uh, council's concurrence here today, um, we have a settlement in place. There may be some further minor tweaks to the wording, um, but the parties, my understanding is, are generally satisfied. Uh, this matter was uh, presented to town council. My understanding is in camera uh, this past Friday, uh, which is why this report was, uh, was slightly later and being sent out to, to county council. And I do apologize for that. As such, uh, county staff are seeking uh, council's uh, support for the draft plan conditions that are provided um, with this report, uh, such that we can move forward, hopefully with a, a settlement before the local planning appeal tribunal. So that's uh, what I have for you today, but I'd certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. Okay, well, <clears throat> well thanks Scott for that. And uh, I'll go back to uh, County Council and uh, just speak up because I can't see you at the point. Uh, just speak up if you have any questions. Anybody out there have any questions or Madam Clerk? I have a question, Mr. Warden. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Scott, I'm just wondering how much of the uh, proposed property uh, is taken up by the um, Indigenous uh, location? Scott? Sure, through you, Mr. Warden. I'm going to try sharing a different uh, map here, just a second. Was that the red area on your map? No, the red area was the town owned lands. Okay. Um, so can you now see the draft plan of subdivision on the map on your screen? Yep. Okay. So the, what's called the Plater Martin lands, the archaeological site, are roughly in, in the north uh, east of the development. And uh, I'm kind of trying to highlight it in my cursor here. Um, so as I said, it's not being developed. You know, if I had to estimate, um, you know, based on, on total land area, it's maybe 15%. Um, but there's a lot of lands even surrounding the Plater Martin lands that are encompassed by the Nipissing Ridge. Uh, so those wouldn't be developed either. Um, what you will see is, is there's sort of a cul-de-sac that ends just before the Plater Martin lands. Uh, so there would be the ability for, for First Nations or other groups still to access these lands. Um, but both through the zoning uh, and through wording in the subdivision agreement, they would be, they would be protected in, in perpetuity. So if I might, Mr. Warden, the the intent <clears throat> excuse me the intent for that piece of the property is to um just remain um fallow so to speak or is it going to be used in some fashion sure through, through you mr warden um that's a, a very good question um in the town's 2004 official plan uh they originally envisioned um um sort of a heritage park here um these these lands have long long been known uh thanks in part to work of, of a, a local gentleman named charles garrard um and so it was always the intent to protect these lands so in the town's 2004 official plan they were going to be made into sort of a commemorative um heritage park um once this particular develop, developer started uh, consulting with First Nations all across North America, because there was a number of nations that have um, used this site in a transitory basis in, in the last couple hundred years, um, it was determined by some of the First Nations that, that they, they actually didn't want to park here. Um, they didn't want um, these lands commemorated in that fashion for a number of reasons, but in part based on worry that um, uh, that you might see some some amateur archaeologists, if you will, um, exploring the site in in a fashion that maybe isn't uh, isn't fitting of these lands. 
As such, what they've asked for is, is protection of the land such that there's no development there, um, but it won't be sort of an open uh, manicured or used park in that sense. They, they will be more of a, a, a naturalized open space. And, and um, one of the draft plan conditions is recommending that we further work with um, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation on, on how these lands um, uh, remain protected, if you will. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Mullen. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. Uh, uh, Councillor Soever. Councillor Soever, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, um, we did meet and we did give instructions to our planning staff to come back with a final version of the settlement agreement once it has been completed. Um, and that has not yet come to, uh, to our council once it's, it's, so there were a few minor issues that were still left to be outstanding. So um, I wouldn't want to have this council jump the gun because the, and give their approval before we have confirmation that the developer has agreed to um, the, the final few minor issues that needed, the, the I's that needed to be dotted and the T's that uh, needed to be crossed. This is one of the problems we have. Uh, this is one of the problems we have with a two-tier planning system when you got two planning departments. Although I know they work together, but um, and you have two councils, um, so. Okay. Any comments, Scott? There. Or? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for those uh, comments, Councillor Councillor Soever. Um, so following the the. Um, town uh, in camera session um, last Friday, uh, the, the um, uh, council for, for each of the parties being the proponent, the, the, the county and the town were all in touch. And, and my understanding is, is um, the town's lawyer shared um, those, those comments that were put forward by uh, town council uh, with respective parties. As such, there were some further changes made to the draft plan conditions uh, to address those uh, comments, it's my understanding. So we're now on what's called version six of the draft plan conditions and, and town staff uh, drafted up some comments uh, to, to address uh, town council's concerns. That's my understanding anyway. And those were shared amongst the parties. And my understanding is that the parties have uh, consented to, to those changes um, that, uh, that town council had requested uh, versus the version that was presented to them last Friday. Thank you. Okay. Madam Clerk, is there anybody else wish to speak to this uh, report? No, sir. Okay, thank you. And again, this was moved by Councillor Keebany and second by Councillor Millen. Uh, any opposed to this uh, report being carried? Okay, hearing none, that is carried. Thank you. Now, we have no closed session uh, or other business on our agenda is uh, uh, delegation requests and I'll, um, we've had some brief comments even at our last council meeting about those and I'm gonna to go to our CIO to uh, update what uh, she has in front of her. Madam CEO. Okay, we have, um, there's a couple that have been raised. Can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, good, sorry. Um, uh, we had previously raised uh, the regional transportation project, a discussion with MTO. Um, yes. I have reached out to Grey Bruce Health Services. Now we have a meeting with them at the first of the week. Um, it, they may be amenable to having a uh, delegation with regard to the uh, Markdale Hospital project. So if that moved ahead, um, we can add that to our delegation list. Um, those were the, the key two there's a there's one that hasn't been um, brought to council's attention yet and it has to do with some correspondence that will be on the july 9th meeting um, that have to do with a request for a protein processing slaughter facility um, and whether or not we want to put a holding spot in there for a discussion in, in that regard you can so that's for the that'd be for the agriculture minister i presume exactly. whatever Exactly. Yeah. Now, I, I, I spoke to um, uh, Minister Walker uh, yesterday or the day before about the Markdale Hospital, 
And he indicated to me that it's on track, um, you know, and he's sort of left it that if there's, if there's issues or concerns to let him know. So he really didn't indicate that we really, other, you know, we're having that meeting next week, which is moving forward. Yeah. I know uh, I spoke to our, our, in Gray Highlands, I spoke to our public utilities director yesterday and they're pretty much worked out all the issues around the site plan other than whatever has to be there. So I think things are moving forward. I just would hate to go in front of a delegate, a minister and not only waste your time, but in a sense of, of, you know, things are moving along. So, uh, it, I mean, we can put it as a placeholder or we have, I think we can have up to three placeholders and we can always, so uh, if we get more information, even from next week that indicates that maybe there's no really urgency to, to meet, I guess we can make that decision later on, but I guess you have to put those requests in. So I, I just, I just gathered that, got that from our, our local MPP, Bill Walker, the other day that, um, as he, as he feels it, it is moving along. And I know even from our local foundation and what I picked up, you know, things seem to be moving along. Um, you yes. know, that was my understanding. So that's good. Yeah. So County Council, any uh, other thoughts on uh, delegation requests? I mean, this is a, vir a virtual delegation and I think, uh, as I understand you, well, I know you have to be registered to be part of those delegations. And I know there's quite a few on county council that are either from the county side or from the lower tier side. Um, but certainly uh, they are very much open to having conversations. Uh, I know it was mentioned about 20 minutes ago about the further um, conversations about infrastructure as far as uh, internet and broadband. And I guess, uh, Madam CAO, if that was a request, that would be through... Yep. Uh, uh, infrastructure minister, would that be, or where would that be, or, or Minister Peterson, or Peters, I should say, Madam Clerk? Yeah, minister Scott. Yeah, Minister Scott, but I, uh, yeah, but also on the other part of, of um, mm -hmm. the multi ministers too, because uh, finance is also part of that probably as well, and, and uh, it, so is that, uh, you know, uh, we can add that, that broadband was on my potential list as well. So for the two earlier discussion that we had. Finance, do we need uh, Minister Finance with regards to, or, or Minister Peters with regards to, um, regards to our COVID-19 expenses and, you know, issues around that is, uh, is that something of concern or something we maybe should follow up on? I, um, I'll leave it there. Yes. Yep. So. Mr. Warden, okay. I can see Councillor Hicks as well. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Hicks, Deputy Warden. Thank you, Mr. Warden. The, the two ministries uh, concerned with uh, um, broadband would be infrastructure and OMAFRA. Okay, so OMAFRA, okay. So, so OMAFRA, OMAFRA, that is uh, Minister Hardiman, right? As far as OMAFRA? Correct. Yes. And if you, if you, so if there's other issues that you want to address along with that, um, yeah, I, th I think the, the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus is, of course, going to continue their advocacy uh, yeah. around future funding. But I think more locally, I, I would want us uh, or would propose that we address the issue of some autonomy uh, for a little bit more autonomy for local municipalities to be able to have some control uh, over decisions like um, fiber versus uh, wireless. Okay, um, thoughts anyone? Kim? Well, I think that's a good suggestion. I think that um, our role to kind of come in behind Western Wardens with the overall advocacy and funding, and then we're to say, you know, wanting to advocate for the ability to um, take some decisions at the council table about the, some of the finer details about the form of those projects that's gonna work the best for the Gray County specific situation. Okay. So, I, so I, I'm sorry. I see uh, Councillor Mackey had his hand up as well. Okay. Councillor Mackey. Thank you, Warden. Um, just wondering if we should be meeting with the uh, Ministry of Health in regards to the, uh, the potential of, uh, you know, one point, was it two or $1.4 million deficit in long-term care, just to make sure that, uh, you know, keep their feet to the fire and uh, let them know that there's uh, been a lot of dollars spent to keep our seniors safe and that we're expecting some uh, uh, help from the ministry. 
Okay, well, that could be along with just the rest of the follow up with long term care and where things are at as well. Maybe I, well, I guess that's a separate ministry. Long term care is separate to Minister of Health, right? Yes. Right. There are two separate ministries now. Um, so, yeah, so that would be Minister Fullerton is if you're talking about long term care. Yes. Right. So, what's your thoughts? Um, so, how many you got in the list there, Madam CEO? <laughs> so, we have. We have broadband, we have regional transportation, um, and then we have uh, the funding support for COVID uh, costs within long-term care. Okay. All right. Does that seem, I know three seems to be the magic number. Um, is that okay with everybody? Do we need a motion then, uh, Madam CEO? Or Madam Clerk? Okay, so who would yes. like to... Uh... You actually have it moved. Um, I think it was in the oh. list that I sent you. Okay, I okay, I do have it here. I not okay. Those that uh, that do have on my list is uh, Councillor Woodbury and Councillor Robinson. Are you okay with those three? I guess in the sense I know it's like a blank sheet, right? So uh, yeah, I'm seeing Councillor Woodbury and Councillor Robinson. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I definitely would. I had a, a list of one, two, three, four, five, six: regional transportation, Markdale Hospital. Uh, um, advocating for broadband funding and I like the add-on of the ability to make the finer detailed uh, decisions at the local level. Advocating for COVID funding um, just overall but definitely for long-term care funding and um, I'm not certain um, I guess we're taking off the list the uh, discussion for abattoirs for uh, at the local level. That so could be a multi prong if we're going to meet with the Minister uh, Omafra with regards to broadband. I, I would think you could probably slide that one in there as well. Yeah, that's creative and a good idea. Okay. So um, I, I was only, always under the impression that you apply for three. Uh, that's sort of your magic number. I guess you could apply for f more. Madam CEO, do you have any? Uh... Oh, yeah, no, it's fine. They, good. they don't mind. Okay. So then um, before I ask the question and can you just refer re, re, uh, remind me or just go through that list so everybody's knowing what we're going to apply for okay so um ministry of long-term care uh ministry of health potentially for the markdale hospital um omafra both for um a slaughter facility but also broadband and okay. mto for uh, regional transportation perfect Okay, so we have four there, and one's a, a moffer would be a multiple, a multi prong for there. So, so then, uh, so again, uh, Councillor Woodbury and Councillor Robinson are moving that. Any discussion on those uh, delegation requests? So, okay, seeing none, anybody opposed to those? That is carried. Okay. Uh, and so as we move forward, uh, Madam CEO, you'll keep us informed uh, closer. Usually it's a week before that they let you know. <laughs> That's right. That's so then right. You're, you're, you're screwing around putting the reports together <laughs> and all that fun stuff, right? So at least, at least you don't have to travel time this time around. Um, just on, just curious for County Council, um, is there quite a few that are attending the uh, AMOL? Okay, just if you want to show your hands, uh, Okay, I'm just going to switch screens here. Okay, so we have quite a few for the delegations in, and I don't know with virtual if there's going to be an issue of the number of people that can attend virtually. It's going to be a whole new process, so we'll find out closer to the time um, from that uh, that point. But uh, that's great. That's super. Okay, uh, so um, our next motion is for adjournment. I don't know if there's any other business. Oh wait, sorry. Notice the motion. Are there any notice of motions? I hear none. Okay, so uh, that's fine. Our, uh, our next meeting uh, will be in July. And uh, so I have a, a motion by Councillor O'Leary, second by Councillor Hicks, Deputy Warden, that we adjourn. Anybody opposed to that? <laughs> well, that is carried. And everybody have a have a, a enjoyable uh, week coming up. We got July 1st, so happy Canada Day, everyone. And uh, be safe, everyone.